Uh, are we on Metro National Network? Yes? Hopefully? Okay. We are back in session. So, um, I wanted to acknowledge Christina's son, Jack, who's the catcher of the West Nashville Heat. And they're going to the state championship. We're very proud of them. And so this is an eight-year-old baseball league. In the, and they're the Cal Ripken District Champions. You know, Cal Ripken, our modern Lou Gehrig Iron Man. And so the, they will be competing in the state championship at the end of June. So good luck, good luck. Nashville Heat. And, uh, you know, I, I understand their slogan is Heat Got Hot. Heat Get Hot. So get hot and bring home a state championship for us and uh, work hard and do well. So congratulations, Christina, on your son, Jack. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case that we'll hear is case 2018-202. It involves the property located at 2301 Buchanan Street in North Nashville, Council District Number 21, shown on the um, zoning map here. This is an RS5 zoned property of note here because it is a question of legally non-conforming use and a proposed change in legally non-conforming use. Again, RS5 zoning. The aerial photograph here shows the um, early 2018 photograph from the aerial of that corner property. From my recent site visit, the face of the property from that intersection, the view up and down the two streets, Buchanan and 23rd, and then the rear of the property where storage is utilized for the retail business. Um, Aline Whitlow is the appellant on behalf of Lynette Whitlow, the owner of that property. As noted, this is an item D case for a proposed change in legally non-conforming use. As the board will recall, although we don't hear a ton of these cases, maybe just a few per year, this is the analysis for the board wherein you determine whether or not the proposed use is closer to being in compliance with the actual base zoning than the previously legally non-conforming use. At least that's the idea. Um, I believe Ms. Whitlow is present, so ready to make a presentation. Before we get started, John Michael, we had a, um, a storage kind of container trailer case a few months ago. Tell us about how the code treats these and why these are not normally permitted. For one thing, the utilization of a trailer as though from an 18-wheeler is not what's conceptualized for storage for a retail business or anything else. It is, after all, a vehicle. Um, Secondly, the case you've referenced, and forgive me for not remembering either the address or the street number, but it was one of the cross streets just less than a block off of the Nolensville Pike Corridor, and we heard it two, no more than three months ago, was a case where it was actually a paved surface in the rear of the retail operation. I believe that was a furniture store, as okay. I best recall. It sold bedding and used that for temporary storage of what was effectively overflow stock. This operation, and I'll allow the appellant to describe her business operation more capably than I would, is effectively utilization of storage for an online retail sales operation. This is a place to keep the product that is being offered for sale in that scenario. Being on grass is a Title 16 property standards issue. Um, you wouldn't be able to put a building or a formal parking sort of situation on grass. And additionally, circling out of the property standards concerns, and that is the basis by which the case came to our attention, it became a pop property standards case for a use not permitted in RS5 zoning. Um, it will circle back to the question of, is this a zoning district? Uh, is this use closer to the intended and allowed uses of that zoning district than the previous legally nonconforming use? Of note, that previous use identified in our land use records was a medical office for the primary structure uh, shown here in this site visit photo. But now, are, are we deciding whether or not the applicant can keep trailers in the yard? Ultimately, that's going to be a property standards question. I just wanted to at least draw some attention to it to acknowledge that that's how it came to the BZA was out of its origin as a property standards case. What you're deciding is whether or not uh, storage for retail sales operation, for an online retail sales operation, is an allowable legally nonconforming use closer to compliance with the RS5 zoning than the prior legally nonconforming use. And nor normally, we think about it in terms of on the in the building that's on the property that's right not necessarily you know in whatever tent or and, and toward, or toward the direction they have right. out there on the property i, I think uh looking to the direction you're kind of pointing with your line of questions there mr taylor um Property standards in the environment, environmental court will determine whether or not it meets all the property standards guidelines. The use, the threshold question, is what's being resolved here today at BZA. Okay. Would a favorable ruling by the BZA keep them from getting into environmental court? Uh, apparently, they're already on their way there or possibly deferred there. I'd have to defer to the representatives from Metro Legal who actually handle those cases in environmental court. Um, however, in this instance, 
I can speak from my own experience of having prosecuted cases there in the past for Metro Legal. The courts always look favorably upon uh, determination from the BZA that a property is, in fact, legally nonconforming and eligible for this item D approval. So last thing, is this an aesthetic rule or a safety rule, or why is the code really well, talk about this? I, again, kind of separating the property standards component of the case, which may have some aesthetic values, but uh, ultimately gets into, uh, well, a number of other issues that aren't before the board today. What's before you is the change in legally nonconforming use, so okay. it is a straight line zoning issue in that regard. Okay, Thank and then, you. I'm sorry, just one last point of clarification because it will be asked of the applicant. Um, you know, if, if it is determined by this board that, that this building, say, not the rest of it, but the building to be used as a, uh, a storage facility is less non-conforming or equally non-conforming as a, uh, on, uh, it says online, uh, a drive-in market, but it sounds like it was a medical facility. That was the last acknowledged land use from the assessor's office. However, it has been other businesses since then by but all that accounts. that change is permanent until another owner comes along and asks us again to say, well, I want it to go back to a medical facility or I want it to be a little retail store or I want it to be something else. They're going to have to come back again and, and there's no guarantee that that would be um, made by the board. So I don't know if the property, I mean, I'll ask the applicant if, if she's the property owner or if she's the applicant, uh, but it, 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 it seems like it might, this decision does have an implication to the property owner and it would matter to that person. Okay. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number um, 202? Yeah. There is. As a result, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Ms. Whitlow, uh, remember if you want to save any portion of that time for rebuttal, save it out of this original 10 minutes. So just introduce yourself by name and address. My name is Ellen Whitlow and the address is 2301 Buchanan Street. Um, I purchased the property in 2008. Uh, prior to that, it was a drive-in a drive market uh, of various not notability. Uh, it was high foot traffic, high car traffic. Uh, the property is located, as you can see, on a four-way stop. Uh, there is always traffic at, uh, generally at all four of those, um, four of the, the entryways into the four-way uh, May, may I ask you on the picture, since we're on the picture, is yes. the drive-in market, the building at the top of the... Absolutely, yes, ma'am. And those three trailers, are those the trailers that you're talking about today? Those are the three trailers in question. However, the, the going back to the that one, <laughs> the trailer that is on the farthest, the farthest side uh, to my left, is actually been removed. Uh, is that and the I red have, one? Yes, sir? The red one? It, it looks red, yes. Sir. Okay, that one's been removed, okay. Yes, sir, and I do have photographs to show that that but has been But it looks like removed. there's another pod in the other picture. Yes, sir, there is a pod, and um, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but I, I do would like to just address that by okay. saying that there was, in February, there was a water event in the building. Uh, there was a burst pipe. The, because it was February, the HVAC was on and it pumped water throughout the building and through the downstairs. So part of the tear out products are, the pods are being used for tear out products and also to move things out of the environment so that they can dry out and so that the, the beams and the underboards in the building can also dry out. And I do also have pictures of the building conditions, uh, pre-water damage, post-water damage, and what is actually happening inside of the building now. Okay, continue with what you were gonna say. All right, so the, the drive-in market uh, was uh, known by a lot of people in the neighborhood as Mr. Spoonie's Market. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, Again, foot traffic, a lot of car traffic there, a lot of loitering, uh, a lot of refuse uh, on and around the building. When I obtained the building, uh, it was in disrepair. Uh, part of the roof was missing. There was a lot of vegetation that was overgrown uh, associated uh, in and around the building. There were um, uh, uh, 
the building was just, uh, again, inside and out, was in complete disrepair. Uh, upon obtaining the building, I did, uh, of course, replace the roof, uh, the, the crumbling facade on the outside, uh, the refuse was, and the overgrown vegetation was uh, bought under control, and then the outside facade of the building was bought in keeping with uh, the facade of a, a, a business. So you, you mentioned that you had a water event, and you were, I guess, in the, you're currently repairing that? Absolutely, yes, sir. When When is that expected to be done? Um, I, they, they are currently at, uh, we've done the dehumid effect and uh, they've done the partial tear out, so they'll complete the tear out, then we'll do restoration. So I'm gonna imagine that that's gonna be uh, two to two to four, two to three and a half months to complete that whole process. What are you trying to do with this building? I would like to uh, have an online market there. Um, the storage containers uh, do contain merchandise uh, that is sold online. Um, it is a, a complete reversal of what was happening at that building prior to my obtaining it. Uh, so that would represent much less foot traffic. Um, absolutely, on that four-way stop, uh, it would reduce congestion in terms of what was happening prior to, to my ownership. So there'll be no members of the public that will call on this business and you won't be selling anything to the general public just online? There may be instances where someone would come to view some of the larger items, for example, a credenza or something that, that you know couldn't be just you know taken to them. But uh, typically they're looking at an item online that's posted online or and making the decision that they they'd like to purchase it. Okay. And as well, uh, I'm sorry. I, as an addendum to that, uh, there are also items that are kept there, and I do have proof of sales uh, that are at Gaslight, um, Antique Mall, and some of the other malls. And again, there there's documentation of that. And will the trailers? be taken away when the building uh, damage is repaired, or are you intending for the yes, trailers Yes, the pods uh, absolutely will will go. And uh, there's the, a possibility. The trailers? There are some smaller pods uh, that right, maybe have some of the other she, pictures. I think she was asking about the trailers. The gooseneck, there's a possibility that that could, which is on wheels, that that could get, but I'd like to keep the, the larger trailer because there, uh, as someone mentioned, there was a medical facility that I uh, operated there prior to that. There's medical equipment that's on there. It was also um, outreach to that particular community, so primarily what we did to reach the largest majority of people was set up at a particular location, for instance, Hadley Park, and have 1,000, 2,000 people come there, so their tents, their tables, and so forth, and they would receive medical treatment there. And the larger trailer that you would like to remain, was it, did it, was it on the property before you purchased it? No, it was not, no, no ma'am. Okay, continue. Uh, again, my uh, argument is that the proposed use represents a substantial reduction in traffic and noise in, um, in, in terms of safety. There are school kids who typically congregate there in the mornings to catch the bus. Other people who are catching uh, public transportation are typically uh, adjacent to the property, and so that re uh, represents a reduction in uh, traffic going in and out of that four-way stop. Uh, it also represents a reduction in, quite frankly, uh, trash and refuse that is left there. Uh, but that, that would be a code. That, that would be a codes violation. You just can't have trash out. I mean. No, no. I'm I'm saying people who are walking. Uh, they've come to the convenience store, purchased a, a bag of chips, or. Oh, but uh, if I own a convenience store, I'm I'm supposed to keep my convenience store on the outside looking nice or the city will come after me. So well, yes, that sir, is not a I good agree. argument saying, okay, because it was a convenience store, there was trash outside. What I am saying is is that uh, although I don't live in the, that community, I was a frequent 
visitor to the community, and I remember what that particular property used to look like. Okay, and well, it, there there was a lot of refuse. Well, with that there was being a lot said, of trash. You there. have some trailers outside. I'm sure there's some people in the neighborhood that would take any sort of wrappers or cans over some trailers. Well, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I maintain those trailers uh, in a manner that um, there's no graffiti on them. There's no graffiti on the building. There, uh, the yard and the lawn, the lot is regularly cut. You know, and well, once it, again, it, it's maintained. You're graffiti, you're, you're supposed to clean up graffiti if it's on your building. Yes, sir. We're not giving out prizes for keeping your property clean. Yes, sir. That's what you're supposed to do. Yes, sir, and I do that. Okay, so that should not be your argument why this is okay. Well, this is not allowed by law, and you're trying to you're you're trying to make an argument of why you should keep it, and so that's what you're here for today. Yes, sir. And again, uh, I would like to reiterate that there are tear-out products that are being stored on the pods, and there are store uh, tear-out products that are being stored. I do have pictures of the insides of the containers, what's on there, and you can see that that. Uh, that I don't really have any place to, to put the merchandise that has been damaged. It must go on the pods in order to dry out. Uh, and it, okay, well, I, I have no other option to put, than to put it on the containers okay, yep. to man, okay. maintain it. Yeah, let's hear from the opposition. And you'll have six minutes and seven seconds after we hear yes, from the opposition. So people that are in opposition, please come forward, state your name and address for the record and why you're opposed. Oh, and please go back in the audience and sit. Okay. And you'll have six minutes and seven seconds to respond to the opposition. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Willie Myers. Uh, I own the building at 2209 Buchanan Street. I sit on the uh, east corner across 23rd Avenue North, across from the appellant's property. So, sir, are you, you're across the street in this picture? I, I am. I'm the building across the street. Okay, Mr. Myers, we have, a, we have a June 12th letter from you that you sent to us. I did. Uh, yes. Uh, commissioners, I'd like to just uh, begin by uh, giving a little history. How long do I have? Two minutes? You have 10. 10. Okay. I, I like to give you just a little history. Uh, I've been on the, I've, I've owned my building uh, at the corner since uh, about 1992. That's over 20 years. Uh, I remember when it was a, a, a corner market, uh, so I know something about that particular episode. Somewhere around uh, 2000, uh, May, I, I think that particular owner and function went away and uh, somewhere it, it's kind of set empty on that corner for about uh, six to seven years, somewhere around 2006, 2007. I believe uh, an entity bought it, they renovated it, and then in 2008, uh, Mrs. Whitlow uh, came and purchased the property and developed it into some kind of, uh, into a uh, medical office facility. Uh, that, that is the basic history of the property. I, I, I can tell you that, uh, to my knowledge, at, at no time previously have uh, six trailers been used as accessory structures for, for, for various and sundry reasons uh, on this site. At no time have, the, have trailers been given a permanent use, uh, such as the applicant is asking the board to allow today. Uh, all the activities of, of the previous businesses, in, including the applicant's previous medical business, as far as I know, were contained, with in, contained inside the physical built structure. Uh, th those trailers weren't there. Uh, the today, if you look at photos, there are at least uh, two large tractor trailer units. There are two pods, and then there are two other uh, intermediate-sized containers on, 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 on the lot. I have no idea what, what's in them or what their purpose was. Uh, the, the applicant is requesting that uh, this board give her a permanent status for having those trailers on site. The, the, the trailers came to the site 
right? Because the applicant, did, as she explained to you, she explained to me previously, I met Mrs. Whitlow before, and she explained to me that she uh, had some damage inside the building. And, and, and I believe that there's been a, maybe an episode, or more than one episode, over, episode of this. First, uh, I think I remember one, one or two trailers came, but over the, over the period of time, they seemed to have grown, and, and I'm sure she has her reasons why the number of trailers has escalated. Uh, as her neighbor, I, I've tried to be sympathetic to her cause, especially the cause of her needing some uh, some space to store her goods during uh, a renovation process. So we, we, we tried to be sympathetic, and I guess we, we've kind of tolerated it. Uh, but Sir, how long, how long has that gone on? I, I, I would say that, to, to the best of my recollection, the first trailer probably showed up may, maybe two years ago, but there was never that one trailer with, with an explanation as, well, I need this for accessory storage due to some kind of internal repair work, fine. But it seems to have grown over the past, I, I would say over the past 15 months or so, it, it seems to, to have grown. Uh, so uh, my, my concern is that uh, the, the space represented by the trailers will be at least 500 square, square feet, but considering the number and the size of the trailers, obviously at least 500 square feet. And uh, I, I was concerned that uh, this, this kind of uh, storage space uh, accessory storage space uh, could constitute, e even if used for her, her proposed purpose of, of uh, an internet business, that that would constitute a uh, could, could constitute an increase in the intensity of use and activity at this site, and that it could have traffic and parking implications. Uh, Mr. It, Mars, may I ask you, please? You own the property we can see in this picture. Or you're across the other street? I'm uh, directly across, Above. that you can see in the picture. I'm directly across the street on that street, 23rd Avenue North. Thank you. And what is your property used for? My, my property is used for rental space. There are a couple of churches in there, a uh, tax office, uh, uh, a couple of other kinds of things that are in that Okay, so a church rents it from you, an accountant rents it from you. They do. All right, it's their businesses. That is correct. And do you object to the use of this piece of property as storage for an online retail business? I, I'm I not addressing the trailers. I'm addressing the use of the property. The building. If you didn't, if you didn't have the trailers in the backyard and she just used the building as storage, do you have a problem with that? If, if, if her... Uh, items were contained within the building, uh, her activities were contained within the building, I don't think that I would have any, any problems with that. that. That is not my issue. My issue is strictly with these multiple accessory structures being used for permanent long-term storage. I, I have a concern that this amount of space, six trailers mind you, uh, they're not subject to uh, the modern building standards, uh, setbacks, screening, uh, structural fire and safety kinds of, kinds of uh, concerns. So that is part of what um, makes, makes me come today. Mo modern building methods. Our, our community is beginning to improve itself. Uh, we, we need every advantage we can to uh, improve this area of North Nashville. And uh, I am... Uh, opposed to anything that could inhibit uh, the uh, improving nature of the neighborhood. It's very slow, but it's beginning, and I don't want anything to slow it down. And I think these trailers maintained on this site permanently would be a hindrance. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for the opposition? Thank you. We're going to hear from the applicant again. And you could, this is a rebuttal period. You get to address what the uh, opposition said. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Mr. Myers is, is correct. There have been, uh, there has been, as he stated, an escalation in the storage containers that are out there. There are current, there currently is uh, two pods and they're currently, and the, I want to mention that the, the, the furnishings that are out there, the picture was taken yesterday, and I do have the receipt and the proof that that was taken away. Uh, the gentleman arrived with a three-quarters full 
truck and were not able to take it away when they brought it out. So that is clear, and I do have the pictures no, and wait, the proof uh, that they were taken Let's talk this about morning. that. So this furniture in there, was that in one of these trailers? No, the, f the furnishings were inside and there's inside water. Inside the building. There's water damage. And again, I do have photos of the water damage so that you all can see so you what's sold, happening on the you inside. So you sold these. I sold them. Did you them. sell these or did you just No, no, the, the, these they're were damaged. Just trash. Okay, you just took these to someone hauled them away for you. Yes. Uh, okay. The stand up guys. Okay. Moving. So when did the water damage happen? Because your neighbor testified that this, the, the, your backyard is kind of look like this for anywhere between 15, 18 months and two years. I thought what I heard him say is that he's concerned that there are more trailers than there were, there were previously, and that is true. There are pods out there because the, in, the contents of the building are being moved, right, my, were my moved question outside. Was when, my question was, when did the water damage happen? The water damage occurred in February, and I do have... Of this year? Yes, sir. Could you share but, those pictures with us yes, now? Sir, yes, ma'am. Do I need to bring them to you? The lady will come and get her. Okay. And the first pictures are prior to the water event and the subsequent pictures are showing what's happening currently and what has been done inside of the building. So is there any permanent solution or five years from now, 10 years from now, you're gonna have a bunch of trailers? No, that? that's not true. The, the pods are being used because the contents of the in, inside our water damage, as you'll see in the pictures, and they have to move out. The beams are soaked, the underboards no, are soaked, and they have was, to come out. You originally testified that you have an online business that yes, you sir. store merchandise and trailers. Yes, sir. And so and in the one, future, one trailer. you will have five years from now, 10 years from now, a trailer behind this property with merchandise in it. One trailer, yes, sir. That's well, your, I mean, well, I, I, I don't, I mean, I guess the bottom line to me is, you know, it, for your building, you know, your, your, your land is owned residential, it's had a commercial build on it, building on it for a good while, and our job here is to decide, because you want to change the use, is the new use any worse than the old use? I mean, is it, is it, yes, is it, it and there's specific language, but about it, but it basically is it is it is this going to be equal or less non-conforming? And with the building, I mean, your neighbor said, you know, he wasn't he wasn't sure that he'd have a complaint if you just used the building. And I'm not sure that the backyard is really anything that we're dealing with. But I don't think you, I mean, you, you certainly don't have my vote to use any of these accessory buildings outside your yard. But I don't have a problem with you using the building as and is the internet built, you know, business that you that you want to do because I think the building uh, is contained. So I guess, uh, you know, I, I need to have a question for you and I don't know that I have a question, but I just want to explain to you where we are or where I am. Um, and, and certainly other board members have expressed a, a, a pretty serious concern about these um, trailers and pods and, you know, everything else in the yard. Um, but I want the, the opposition to know too that we're really kind of looking at two different questions and, and, and only one of which I think we really have to answer and that is you know, the use of that building as a non-conforming uh, piece of property uh, and, and how we separate it with, you know, and again, I may be getting in the weeds. So I, I, have a, I have a couple of questions. So is the building itself big enough for your online operation storage? Not, not the the level of merchandise that that's on the container. So no. Okay. So I would need so, one container. So the the second question is the the tr you wanted to keep the trailer with the medical devices. Yes, and there is some inventory on that trailer as well. Well, that that was my follow up. So okay, so that trailer. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else to add? I, I just would like to say that I have had conversations with Mr. Myers, and I respect him. He is a great neighbor. Um, I, I wish that uh, I knew the full extent of, of his um, 
opposition uh, so that we could have come to some type of conclusion without him having to, to come down here. What I'm asking the board for is to, to be allowed to use the one trailer that is in the back and have it noted that the pods that are on the property are being used because there has been water damage in the building, all of which I have proof of and yeah, pictures. I, I need to make something clear, and so I'll ask our, our uh, code members here. I mean, I don't think we have any ounce of authority to give her permission to use a trailer. Is that true? Just from my perspective, it, it sounds to me like property standards already has an RFS complaint. It sounds like they're already working the case. Perhaps it's already in environmental court. But under their code, you can't park on the grass. And these are clearly parked on the grass, so they can't stay on the grass. And so, I, yeah, so I mean, but, but even, even our decision of using this as another, you know, changing one non-conforming use to another, doesn't really, I mean, they still have to follow all the other codes. And we're really talking about, I mean, we're talking about the, the, the property, but the property as uh, developed appropriately through codes. I mean, so, I mean, if, they, if she wanted to add on to the back of her building and, and it was, she didn't need any variances and it was all, got a permit and did it, that's, she can continue to store and, and use that addition, but, but you can't just park a trailer there because we told her she could use the building as a certain use. That's, that's correct, and, and Mr. Taylor, you correctly stated the issue in front of the board about five minutes ago when you summarized why you're here today. You correctly stated the issue. Okay. Thank you. Just to summarize, we're here only to determine whether or not the building itself is allowed to still be non-conforming. Okay, and if we decide that the use is allowed in the building, it doesn't mean our decision allows them to keep trailers and pods on the site. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? Well, I, the only, because it will matter, you, when you, you said you, an internet-based, tell me how an internet-based based building is different than a retail store. You said you thought people were going to come, um, but if we were to because we have to define what you're going to use this thing for, and right now you want to use it, it says, I guess, an, an online retail market. But, yes, you, sir, you, that, that's but you, you do expect to have walk-up customers or people that... I do not expect to have someone come unannounced. Okay. They would be coming specifically to see an item that was advertised online that might be very large. Okay. Last question. The opposition part is over. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to close public hearing discussion. I don't think the proposed use of a retail online market is any further away from the non-conforming uses that we've heard discussed today. That does not mean that the manner in which she is operating her business meets with the other code requirements, but for purposes, in my mind, uh, the, this non-conforming use keeps her neutral in terms of where she is for purposes of use of the par property. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an issue with the, the online market per se, especially since it was, um, a, it seems a more active market. I mean, I think it is probably less non-conforming and I think that's a criteria. And so that piece I don't have an issue with. I do have a real serious issue with the, the trailers and would want to make clear in any uh, motion that, that we do not approve of the use of trailers. And as far as we're concerned, that's somebody else's business and, and we're not oh, allowing the trailer. Yes. I have another question for John Michael. It's actually the same question that I asked previously. This case will be in front of environmental court. If we rule, even not talking about the trailers, just on the use, it sounded like your previous answer that would potentially have an effect on environmental court the way that they would. Look it's certainly at. not going to hurt a defendant in that scenario because the question of whether or not the property, 2301 Buchanan, is in fact permitted for this particular use. If the board votes yes, this is an appropriate appeal for an item D case, then that will be considered an appropriate use, whether categorized as inventory stock or general retail. Um, 
thus taking that issue off the table in environmental court and perhaps just leaving the question of these accessory trailers or structures that are being used for external storage. Okay, but that, the, the, the trailer issue will still be ripe with them. Properly heard in the proper, proper venue. Okay, very good. Anyone have a motion? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll move that that in this item D case, a change in legally non-conforming use from drive-in market to an online retail market, which it was described by the appellant as probably closer to an inventory stock, um, an inventory stock use. Uh, is acceptable by this board. And as part of the motion, we'll make note that this board did find it disturbing that the appellant uh, was using accessory structures in a way that appears to be inappropriate and in violation of codes, and that this ruling in no way endorses that use. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. John Thank Mike. you, board. Mr. Chairman, the next case is to be heard by the board of 2018-240 and 2018-241. We recommend that the board hear the cases together as they involve the properties at 1808A and B, Warfield Drive and Council District Number 25. Of note, you have the somewhat recently received email from the council member for District Number 25, Mr. Russ Pulley, regarding his input on, this, on these particular cases. The cases are requests for sidewalk variances in the R10 zoning district in order to build the structures uh, shown as an HPR map here on the zoning map. Shown the, from the is area the here. here please come plan. forward if you are. Uh, Jeffrey Hart is the appellant on behalf of Tim Reynolds, the owner of the properties. Is the appellant present? Seeing no appellant, Mr. Chairman, and I, forgive me, I believe that's the second what, time we've been the, set. What's the person's name again? Uh, Jeffrey Hart is the appellant on behalf of Tim Reynolds, the owner of the property. Okay. Or we'll take anybody else. No dice, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Wait, now this is the second time we've had this? Second time we've had no show, I believe. And in, in, in honor of the late John Ward, give him a denial. Yeah. Um, Does anyone have a motion? Um, uh, yeah, I, I'll uh, move on case 240 that we deny the request. And I think that's also based on uh, the council members recommendation and the planning department's recommendation. Okay, motion. add to the motion, if you don't mind, also that there's significant written opposition in the file as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, motion passes to deny. Next motion. If we could also solicit that second motion, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, on case I'll, 241. I'll also move that we deny uh, case 241, the variance request, based on the recommendations of the planning department, the council member, and the significant opposition of uh, the neighbors. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-251. By whatever reason, that does not appear in our presentation, visual presentation of the board today. However, you have case 251 in your case packets. Chuck Pates is the appellant on behalf of Holly Lovell, the owner of the property at 903 Winston Place. Also in council district number 25, as noted, you have your correspondence from council member Russ Pulley on this matter. I know that the council member and the appellants have been in recent communication with regard to the case and will allow the appellant, of course, to speak to their end of that. You also have the written correspondence from the council member to speak to his end of that. The request is for a, a couple of variances. First, from minimum separation requirements of the two residential structures or proposed residential structures on the existing um, residential lot, and also from rear setback requirements in this an R10 zoning district. The request is effectively to convert a detached garage into a second single family residence on this property. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 251 involving the property at 903 Winston Place? 
Seeing note in the audience, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just please introduce yourself by name and address. My name is Chuck Pates. I live at 903 Winston Place. Um, I believe Councilman Pulley did send some correspondence. We talked uh, after the um, June 8th hearing on that Friday. Uh, he wanted to have more public input. Uh, I expressed to him that we were deferred until today. The two-week notice he thought was going to be difficult to hold a public hearing. Um, he requested the um, list of 100 and I think six members in the 600 foot radius. I sent that to him. I also told him that I am the leader for um, a neighborhood group called nextdoor.com. Uh, it is a private social media. Uh, there's about 150 members in my neighborhood. I sent a message out to all of them. And he uh, agreed that that would be an appropriate way to speak with my neighbors. Um, everyone I've spoke with is in not opposite, has no opposition to what we're being presented. Um, what we're asking for is a hardship on the setbacks. Um, that is due to the size and the shape of my lot. We are confined by um, setbacks, the permanent structures, which is an existing detached garage, um, a pool, an existing house. So I only have one way to go, which is forward. Um, there is a non-permitted shed that was attached to that detached garage when I purchased the property that is being removed. Yeah, I believe it is non-conforming um, and it was sitting within the setback. So that has been removed. Um, what we're asking is for... Um, the council person has still requested that he have time to talk to the community. Are you objecting to that? No, I, no, I was not. And he said that um, send me the list of people. I will reach out to those yeah. constituents. I have an email from him that says that he does not oppose That's this variance. We're reading the letter now. It was in another package, so yeah. we're trying to catch okay. up. Okay. Yeah, we, we've had a problem communicating electronically. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. So he, he was not opposed to this. Okay. So uh, the, the questions I have on this are, and I, I, I'll need to ask the, uh, the coach folks, uh, you know, the only kind of flags, I think, you know, it, if, as long as you own it, you know, I think you were building this for elderly relatives, is that what you, I think, Correct. you testified before. And, you know, that's what I think, well, you know, that, that, that's great. It's, it, it sounds like a really good, good thing to do. Um, but would you, you know, uh, so you don't have any intention at, at, at now or in the future of doing it as kind of a short-term rental or anything no. like that? No. So you, you wouldn't be opposed to say, you know, if you were to do that, you'd have to come back and ask permission? No, and I don't, I don't mind signing an affidavit that it would never be used as Well, a, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm just, yeah. Right. And then I guess the other, the only other question is to, it's that if it's a second dwelling unit, does that just allow you to kind of sell either one or, I mean, it just seems like that. It's, it's all being under the same utilities, so it's not separated on utilities. It's all under the main house. Okay. Okay. That, 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 helped, that helped with the question. Right. I just wanted to make sure that, uh, and again, it's not, not, it's not for you. Um, it really is for, maybe down the road for someone in the future right. saying, oh, boy, this is a, this is a grandfathered in, too. Sure. I can tear it down and build mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff, you know, once you all decide to leave the right. property. Okay. And that's really where my concern was. Right. Do we have any questions for the applicant? Well, I have to say the architect in me is concerned. You're bringing a structure in my notes that said one foot eight away from an existing structure. Is that so I right? believe the minimum distance is six feet. Yeah. It, will you stay six feet away? Because it looked like you were coming within one foot eight of your existing well, home. Well, so, so the minimum distance is six feet. We're asking for one foot eight. Okay, Th and that steps us off from the permanent structure. Okay, so are you aware that you will most likely need firewalls in mm -hmm. your new structure between, mm -hmm. you are aware of that? Yes. Okay, as long as yes. you're aware of that. Yeah. Okay, any other questions of the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? No, sir. Let's close the public hearing discussion. Yeah, or a motion. Um, I'll move that we grant the variances for minimum separation requirements and rear setback 
uh, in this R10 district for this piece of property to convert the detached garage into a second uh, single family residence uh, with the conditions that it will not be used for um, short term rental and that the property not be uh, sold as two residences that it's, it, it stays as one uh, one residence okay. uh, two two homes on one piece of property okay motion's been made is there a second do do we have to find a hardship I, I will say because all conditions have been met for <laughs> the 17 more two, uh, you know, it, it, the shape and the size of the lot. I think, Would you take I think this? the shape and the size of the lot, uh, and um, okay, as, as well as existing features that that, uh, that that cause this requirement. Okay, that's Mr. Taylor's motion. Is there a second? second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, one in opposition. It passes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-252 involving the property at 1802 8th Avenue South in Council District Number 17. You have in your case file updated correspondence from the District Council Member Colby Sledge. Joni Elder is the appellant. Uh, Ms. Norman and Ms. Stratton, the owners of the property, at this address. The request is for a special exception and a variance. The special exception for the use in question as a kennel. The variance from minimum separation requirements in the CS Zoning District, the separation requirements from nearest residential structures in this case. The area photograph shows the property here right along the 8th Avenue corridor just north of Wedgwood. The site plan submitted shows proposed layout for the operation uh, sought by Ms. Elder. From my recent site visit, the photographs of the subject property in the lower right hand across the street in the upper left and the view up and down 8th Avenue South, southbound in the top, northbound and toward the city in the lower right hand corner. As you may recall, this case came to the board recently. However, um, the Neighborhood meeting as required under board rules for special exception cases had not been completed. It's my understanding that that has been completed now. And so the appellants are properly before the board having met all the requirements to be here today. There is opposition to the case. Therefore, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. The same reminder we give everyone else, save some portion of your 10 minutes if you wish to use it for rebuttal time. Just introduce yourselves by name and address and present to the board. Before we get started, uh, Ms. Chapel, you have something you want yes, to Yes, I have a disclosure. Uh, I have had the pleasure of being personally and professionally related with Pia Stratton's extended family. She is one of the owners of this property. I don't believe that that will affect my ability to make a decision in this case, but I did want to disclose that both for the applicant and any opposition that is present. Okay. Duly noted. Please get us started. Thank you. My name, and I apologize for my voice, my name is Joni Elder. I reside at 391 Dandis Drive in Franklin. With me today... Liz Craig and, oh, sorry, Liz Craig and, Liz Craig, and I reside at 4811 Kentucky Avenue. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to the board for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to also apologize um, to the board and to the neighbors who were here at the previous meeting for my error in coming to the board with uh, last session with out having conducted the neighborhood meeting, I sincerely want to work with the neighbors um, and be part of the neighborhood community. And if I had known there was no need for the meeting, I would have met with them before then. It was an honest mistake that has been rectified. For today, I would respectfully request to the board that my request for the special exception and variance be broken up into two parts. First of all, the request for an indoor only play facility. And secondly, then for a, a, the property to include an outdoor play area. That, those both elements were included in my initial request. So I'd like to address first the request for the indoor Dogtopia daycare. Before we get started, John Michael, what do you think about that? I know we noticed something different. Ultimately, it's still a special exception case either way. What's really being spoken to are the particular conditions whereby the appellant seeks to operate the proposed business. Those are conditions that the board could take into consideration as restrictions or allowances uh, pursuant to the special exception if in fact granted. Okay. 
Yes, please continue again. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to address the indoor Dogtopia daycare. Dogtopia is a high-end dog spa where pet parents take their dogs to be pampered. Think the equivalent of a nice people spa. I did summer, I send around a one-page summary pictures of what it looks like um, on the inside. We are the largest daycare in the country with almost 80 units in operation. It is a franchise. I am looking to only have one uh, at, at Pia's and I do have a second one. We will have the l highest level of sound abatement in the industry in the facility. Dogs inside tell, the playroom. Tell me what that means. Um, you said the, the highest level of sound abatement. Tell me what that means. Yes, um, that was included in the initial deck that was presented um, to the board during the last session. I believe you still have copies of that. It includes, um, it includes uh, uh, very large steel beams, a significant amount of insulation, a one inch, I'm sorry, one inch sound a watt air barrier. Um, those things in com uh, conjunction, and I apologize, I'm not a construction um, person, although I'm living in the middle of construction miasma right now. Um, my understanding is that is considered high performance. It exceeds the level of what the other daycares in Nashville and in the country in general utilize and the reason why we utilize that is because we are looking to be convenient to where people live and so sound abatement is of critical importance does that answer your question okay, okay. Mm. Dogs, so dogs inside the playrooms will not be able to be heard from a distance in excess of 50 feet or more which is a far shorter distance than a hun approximately 147 feet, which are the, where the closest neighbors reside. Our indoor play area is not a kennel where dogs run in and out barking uncontrollably. Um, we have expertly trained canine coaches in the rooms with the dogs, and we teach them deep skills on how to manage the playroom and redirect dogs that are barking into more productive and happy activities. I propose to the board the evidence of this is that in 10 years, there have not been any sound or order issues, odor issues across Dogtopia's almost 80 stores, which demonstrates that we have those stringent protocols in place to address concerns on these fronts for the indoor play area portion. Our location, are, are the other facilities located this close in a residential area? It, they are all over the board. Some facilities are close to residential areas. Some are in strip malls where the neighbors also do not want uh, loud noises that would interfere with. Um, one is located next to a Sylvan Learning Center. Um, so, so yeah, which goes back to the, the soundproofing. Um, and uh, if, if we didn't have the level of soundproofing we're talking about, there there would incredibly be a lot of issues. Our locations are designed to be placed in accessible areas like PIAs near neighborhoods and strip malls to be convenient and our construction requirements and sound abatement address the noise concerns. I'd like to also address the need of the broader community. There is a sizable need for this service as dogs have become the new babies. Um, well over 100,000 dogs r are, are within the radius of a 10 mile radius of the proposed store. A key demographic attached to Nashville are millennials who are electing to delay having kids and filling the void with furry children. Since they grew up in daycare, they actually want the best care for their dogs. It's extremely difficult for pet parents to find high quality daycare in Nashville. The best daycare facilities in Nashville are consistently full. One that I'm aware of has a six month wait to take new dogs for daycare, which outlines the broader community need. The same is true and even more so regarding the difficulty of finding high quality places where your dog can stay overnight. They're consistently booked weeks in advance and in holidays, months. In addition, I'd like to address the outdoor play portion. My original request included outdoor. I'd like to withdraw the request for an outdoor play area. After hearing the concerns that the neighbors rightfully brought um, forth, um, I, I understand um, that that's a problem for them. I truly do want to work with the community to find a solution that can address the concerns of the neighbors, the broader community needs, and my desire to have a great daycare service that'll be an asset to the community. 
Um, I ask that you grant my request for the indoor uh, daycare. I, I spent 25 years in corporate America in client service industry, consulting, providing great service, and balancing the needs of multiple parties I, uh, to achieve great outcomes. And I, you have my commitment that I will work with you, with the, with the neighbors, to be a great neighbor and a community asset. Any questions for the applicant? I do. For some reason, I can't find how close are you or how much of a variance are you asking from the 200 feet separation distance? The closest one now, this is approximate. We're using Google Maps and, and you use the laser site. It's 148. 47. Uh, 47, sorry, 148, seven feet from the closest point in my building that will not necessarily be a daycare room to where the closest address is, which is- The which, property line? The, no, the actual uh, building. The actual building. And as I said, the, the noise abatement, I have stood in the parking lot of the busiest store in the dog daycare that we have, eight out of 80 stores. I've st stood in the parking lot of one in um, Tyson's Corner, Virginia, that had a lot of dogs in excess of 100 the day I stood in it. You could not hear the dogs from 50 feet away. In fact, they have a whole glass front of one of their playrooms, and I couldn't hear it from 50 feet away. And my location at PIA is, if, if approved, it's going to have a glass front lobby. That's not where the play areas are going to be. They're going to be, I don't have the design, but not in, near the glass fronts. So they will have the added brick and brick and mortar of, of PIA's, as well as our normal sound abatement. And then, um, do you have, will you have dogs overnight? Yes, we are. For the convenience of pet parents who have um, dogs in the facility, um, you know, one, if you use their dog in daycare when you go to work, if you travel for work or go on vacation, you want your dog where they're comfortable. And we can't see it on this photo right now, but is the one 147 feet from your building to the building that was to the north on the... To, to the back right, I don't know. To the know. back right, I don't know my I don't know the directions. <laughs> yeah, up, uh, up, up. I can't see the windows. Uh, that's, that's, um, the picture's oriented different, so if you were to take the far right corner of her building now at the bottom and go to the right, there's a little jut out portion of the apartment. I know you can't Oh, see you can only see the, on, on there on the right hand side of the picture, the windows is obscuring the view. That's the parking lot of the building that is near. Right, and if you go from the bottom right hand corner all the way to the right and cross over the alley, um, your software center sign's covering up just a little bit. The closest is 147 square feet. And then if you go to the front of the main part of the building, it's 163 from the opposite corner of the building, so. Any other questions? You'll have four minutes and 35 seconds for rebuttal. Let's hear from the opposition. You'll have 10 minutes combined. So the first person speaks for eight minutes and there's only two minutes left. Please state your name and address and why you're in opposition. So uh, my name is Nick Ridings, I live at 746 Wedgwood Park. Um, so I'm, we, we are not the closest, the closest to them was gonna be a senior apartment center. Um, I'm actually the closest president on the HO in the, uh, in the Wedgwood Park. You can see our buildings right at the very bottom right of the, uh, of the, um, of the picture there. <clears throat> my concern is that that alleyway right there that's kind of, that they spoke of right behind the PIA building, is a very active alleyway. So people are walking their dogs. There's many people that are just transient in nature. They're going through there. I drive that alley five, six, seven times a day. My main concern was if there was an outdoor area that those dogs would be going nuts on people walking by, cars driving by all the time. And that was gonna be, that was my, that was issue. Now she's talk, talked about a non-outdoor area. Um, I still have an issue with the fact that, you know, there, that is a very much of a, a walkway area for residents with dogs. And if there's going to be dogs in and out of that, in and out of this building, there will be barking and there will be absolute, uh, you know, kind of disruption of the day. I'm a telecommuter. I work from home. I, I work in this area. I walk around this area all the time. There is a ton of traffic in this area, foot traffic, and also just uh, cars driving up and down in this back area very slow. So there's be apt for the dogs to be very loud and parking it. But I, I, and I, I appreciate, I, I totally get the outdoor space. Um, 
and I was I was glad to hear the applicant say that they wanted to take that out because that was obviously the one of greatest concern and and I think it was a noble of or, or it was good of the per, of the applicant because to in, out of uh, respect to the neighbors that she clearly heard right yep. but I guess the question on you know, I mean, you're saying that the alley's active. There are a lot of people that have dogs in the area. They're walking their dogs. And so, you know, we can talk with the applicant about how to address the back of that property through fencing or through you know, other means to, to provide maybe a visual screen or even a little more sound. But it, it mm -hmm. seems like most of the folks are going to enter through the front. Uh, of that property and kind of just get your dog or drop your dog off and that why would it be more disruptive than someone walking their dog down the alley if 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 it was the 8th Avenue side yeah. where the business was taking place so I, I came here to speak on, on my behalf that that alley was a very active right. alley um, and I was very worried about a playground uh, for dogs in that back area so that's you know my point of being here is a little bit taken off okay. the off the table but I still do I mean you know without seeing the design and understanding how she's going to bring dogs in and out of that building and or create that whole back area as a potential parking spot I have I take I take issue with it okay. My name is Cynthia Minor. I live at 702 Wedgwood Park, which is down to the bottom of the uh, screen. Um, my issue with the uh, application of the um, applicant is that it does not conform to the 200-foot setback that this BZA uh, imposed for kennels. Uh, she can call it a dog spa or a daycare center or whatever it is, but for the purposes of the code, it is a kennel. And uh, a kennel is defined by uh, the metro government is where dogs are boarded overnight, which she will have. Uh, there are 100, there are 80 senior citizens in that residence that's to the back of this, uh, uh, this place. Um, and it, it would appear to me that when in 2010, this board rewrote the rule relative to kennels, and it was enforced as a the meeting. Metro Council rewrote. Metro it. Council, I'm sorry, so you're not based on your based on your recommendation, <laughs> uh, and in 2013 that was imposed. That it was done for the particularized reason that this board saw fit, or the Metro Council saw fit, that that 200 set 200 foot setback be in place. She showed no compelling interest why this board should, or, or reason why this board should deviate from that. She has not signed a, a lease for this facility. That's what she told us. She hasn't drawn a, a, a plan for the facility. So she has no uh, losses if, this, if she is forced to comply with a 200-foot setback. Uh, additionally, um, being 186 existing residences um, is, is important to us because there are always more residences online. We live in a very uh, high bill area right there on 8th and Wedgwood. Um, there are lots of buildings, lots of residences being um, um, built there. All, most of us own our residences. They're not apartments. Um, and I think that when, during the discussion that the BZA had in 2010 through 2013, um, when they amended when this code was amended, this ordinance was amended, the first thing, number A, was the 200-foot setback. And without any reason um, espoused by the applicant as to why you should deviate from that, I don't understand why um, this uh, board would. Additionally, there is another former Dogtopia that is right down the block, uh, two block, three blocks away, now called South Paws. Uh, it was granted its a variance in, 20, in 2008. Um, interestingly enough, uh, they comply with your current um, BZA requirements without, uh, without these different um, guidelines that were set up in 2013. You mean the setbacks? The setbacks. They have the setbacks on every side. They back to the reservoir, uh, a two-lane street, 8th Avenue on the front, and they are 220 feet away from the nearest uh, apartment complex, which is diagonally to the uh, north and west of them. And so, do, do they have an outdoor play area, do you know? They do have an outdoor door play area, and that outdoor play area abuts the reservoir uh, on 8th. You, you want to go? Go I guess the, the, only, the only question I have, and, and again, I, and I'm, I'm just trying to understand, so I, I'm not asking it with uh, with any intent in mind, but the, 
you know, the, the 200 feet, I understand, uh, you know, we had a, a, a kennel issue uh, at a previous meeting, and I don't think any of the houses were within 200 feet, but they had 70, 80 dogs there, and everybody, mm -hmm. and, and it was in an it was in a agricultural area where you'd think a kennel should be, and everybody was complaining because they could hear the dogs barking because they were outside. Mm -hmm. But as the applicant said, I'm not going to have any dogs outside. Does that change that 200 feet to you at all? Because it seems to me like. Mm -hmm. It's the 200 feet has more to do with the distance from the outside barking than potentially inside with no barking. Well, no, because the the code as it's written indicates that she can have an outside play area, which would mean an additional 100 feet um, from the building. So that buffer would be there. I think the problem is that if if, we're, if what is the purpose of the code if if you can just come in and say, well, I want to change it because I want to have a business there. Well, if well, everything if everything went totally by the right. code, we wouldn't have this board. I understand, that's and, so that's why, board. and that's why we're appealing to the board to enforce the uh, the code as written. But In addition to that, um, there will she she said at the public meeting that there will be dogs that they will walk up and down. Um, somewhere, I don't know where, but what you have to see is that there's only one way in, two ways in and out for us residents. That's that street right there behind the building. That's the, an alleyway that uh, at least 120 of us use to get to our homes. So I don't know if she's going to walk dogs. We don't know if she's going to pick up waste. She said she would, and I have no reason to believe that she wouldn't, but we don't know uh, because workers are workers. She's not going to be out there walking them. Um, and uh, her response to that was only one in 40 dogs have to use the bathroom outside. Now she's got this one, she's got this upscale posh place. I would submit to you that if I come into the upscale posh place and I tell you all oh, my dog walked outside, you're not going to tell me they got to use the, 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 uh, the doggy pad in the corner. So. So these are the issues that um, um, I represent and bring to uh, to the board relative to that. And there will be dog noises. We, all of us who've owned dogs, dogs bark. That's how they make their noises. As it relates to the soundproofing that she verged to, we have no proof of that. I mean, I, 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 we, I, we, we're, we're left to just take her word that this is 50 feet worth of soundproofing, even though she said that it'll have a drop ceiling uh, in, a, in a commercial space. Noise travels up. So I, we don't know what the noise factor will be until she gets in there, and then when she gets in there, then what do we what do we do then? Come back. Go ahead. I'm Doc McDowell. I live at 702 Wedgwood Park, Unit 306. I'm also the president of the Homeowners Association for the Wedgwood Park Homeowners Association. Uh, I appear before you in opposition to the application. I'm sorry. Can you tell me where Wedgwood Park is? Um, it's cut. Oh, okay. go back to that last one. It's right okay. where the the, uh, the, the icon is. is. Yeah. Uh, all those buildings right there. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure. Okay. Um, I, I've submitted to you a summary of the arguments that we uh, present to you today. Uh, I would start off with the first point: uh, is that there are 186 residents who are opposed to this uh, kennel. Uh, that is documented by exhibits one, two, and three, and four. Specifically, uh, there are 63 residents within our community who are opposed. We represent those individuals. Some of them were so vehemently opposed that they wanted to sign written objections. Those are under exhibit one. With respect to the Midtown Parkview Apartments, which is located at the corner of Ridgeland and Wedgwood Park, there are 30 residents there. Uh, the owner of that facility has given his have given has given us his permission to present his opposition. That is 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 at uh, Exhibit Two. Um, with respect to the Argyle Avenue Senior Citizens Complex, which is the building that uh, the testimony so far indicates is 147 feet away, there are 80 senior citizens there over the age of 55. We have an affidavit from that entity at exhibit number three indicating their opposition to this facility for the reasons stated. Uh, A, excessive noise caused by dog barking, unsafe and unsanitary conditions caused by dog feces and urine that will be placed in the garbage dumpster, dumpster located near the alley that separates the Argyle Avenue Senior Citizen Facility from the kennel. And let me pause on that. 
Um, we've talked a bit here about soundproofing. Well, let's talk about stench proofing. If you put your dog feces into the dumpster and leave it in the dumpster, uh, the testimony on Sunday was that it was gonna be picked up twice. If it's picked up twice, that's at least two to three days that it will be in the dumpster no matter how you divide up seven days. Well, uh, uh, on a day of 92 degrees, 100 degrees uh, of uh, sunlight beaming down on that dumpster, who do you think will smell the odors emanating from it? We will. Who do you think will smell the urine pads that are deposited in it? We will, and so will the senior citizens who live in the uh, unit, uh, the building that is 147 feet away by the applicant's own admission. Now continuing, see uh, the senior citizens starting at age 55, uh, state that there's noise, noise will be generated by the dogs, by the dogs as they are walked, uh, as they run and play. Uh, we talked about the dog play area, that, that's not in play here, but the applicant also said that she, anticipates that dogs will be walked through the community. Uh, when asked whether or not she would use the two parks, the two pristine parks that we like, uh, McNeil Park and Reservoir Park, she said, well, I don't know if we will do that. Well, at the high stakes we're dealing with here, I take an I, I don't know as, yes, you probably will. And so now we've got what? Possibly an increase in assessments for our residents to pick up whatever trash and debris is left by the dogs, possibly an increase in taxes to clean up the parks. Uh, I put that question to the applicant at the Sunday meeting and she said, I don't know. Uh, that is a major concern, but the biggest concern is the stench that will come from the dumpster, which clearly, based upon the applicant's own testimony, will have to be located in the alley in order for the trash pick, pick up businesses to pick it up or have access to it. Now, continuing, uh, we also spoke with Ridgeland Building Partners. Uh, they were supposed to have a representative here. They indicated that they were opposed to it. Now, continuing on our summary of uh, the reasons why we are opposed, the distance between the proposed kennel and the senior citizen apartments, uh, no soundproofing in the ceiling of the kennel. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Miner is absolutely correct. Even if you put in soundproofing on all of the exterior walls, you have a drop ceiling. Depending upon the decibels of the dog barking, depending upon the volume of how the dogs bark, uh, that certainly is going to be a, a concern for us as neighbors. There's no reasonable remedy for nighttime uh, uh, dog excuse barking. Excuse me, sir. Hang on one second. Uh, Our time's up, and I don't, I think it's an important piece. Can we allow each side to have Minutes. Yes. Two more minutes for each side. Does that mean I can keep talking? Okay. Yes, that yeah, means great. Talk about the accessory building for trash. Oh yes, and well, yes, and of, and of course the code requires that. With respect to the dumpster, it has to be contained. It has to be uh, a building uh, that encloses it. There's been no testimony about that. But even with the, that dumpster being enclosed, you can't enclose odors. Uh, I'll give you an anecdotal example. Uh, we like baked chicken. Uh, it's my job to chop it up. I'm the sous ch chef. My wife says, get that chicken out of here, the backbone, the, 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 the chicken neck, whatever. I leave it in there two or three hours, ah, it'll be all right. Well, guess what? Within two to three hours, you can smell that chicken within your own kitchen. Now imagine what happens to dog feces in a dumpster that all of us in this community will have to tolerate and put up with if this is approved. No, this should not be near a residential community. And the reason why it shouldn't be is precisely because you passed this ordinance, that's, you didn't pass it, Metro passed it, because you don't want residents this control, to, this close to this type of activity. Continuing, there's no reasonable remedy for nighttime barking control. Uh, the applicant testified uh, that, uh, that uh, the dogs would be too exhausted to bark at night. Really? That's the remedy for nighttime dog barking. That was her test, that, that's what she said. That's what she said on Sunday. Um, there's no plan to control nighttime uh, barking because no employees will be on site. Um, there are unknown number of dogs that will be kept at the kennel. Dog barking during pickups and drop-offs. There's no soundproofing for that. And I guarantee you that the dogs will bark as they depart their owners and as they leave the strangers at the, uh, uh, at the kennel and return to their owners. 
and of course the kennel will be closed from 7 p.m. until 6 a.m. Dog walking in the community, I've test, I, I mentioned that, and then of course I mentioned the unsanitary conditions. Uh, in summary, I would submit to you that okay. this will cause a devaluation okay, of our property. Time's up. I'm good. Very good. Questions for the applicant? I mean the opposition. We'll sit down. Wait. Oh, we're not. Okay. We might have some questions. So this. This, she, this uh, packet, it says 186 people object to this. So you list a, the Argyle Avenue Senior Citizens Apartment. You said that there were 80 people that live there. And yes. all 80 people object? How do you know? Well, I don't know uh, the answer to that. Uh, but I can tell you what the management said uh, to me when I went in and spoke with them. The management says, we object on behalf of the 80 people. Now, should I have talked with the 80 senior citizens and polled them? Uh, I don't think so, because if management that is running that particular entity takes a position that they are pro opposed to it, that should be sufficient. But, but let me also add to that that these are senior citizens who have a, a lot more uh, elements and concerns than probably we do, and certainly you can extrapolate from that that there would be some concern. I would also add this. You could put this question to me. Um, do all uh, 63 people of, our, uh, of the Wedgwood Park uh, oppose this? Well, the board speaks for them, and I would presume that the management speaks for the 80 people in that particular building. And as we talked about at the top of this meeting, you can email us at pca at nashville.gov, express your support or opposition to anything on our agenda uh, before we hear it. And are there any case, are there any letters in our packet in support of this? I didn't see any either. Okay. Any other questions for the opposition? Okay. Thank you. We're going to hear you. from the applicant please, again. Please disapprove of this. Okay. Let's hear it when the applicant come back, and this is your time for rebuttal. I'd like to also submit the sign-in sheets in the meeting, which there were seven people I meant to um, okay, that thank before. Okay, you. And yep. before you get started, uh, yes, the sir. opposition said that the there would be no employees on the site from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m., is that correct? No. Um, what are the it, hours of your, as far as having someone on site? I will be open, meaning pet parents can drop off their dogs between 6.30 and 7 p.m. That means the front lobby, which will, the parking lot that you see um, right, well, on the front of the building, they'll drive up to the front of the building with their dog, come through the double glass doors. Mm -hmm. There'll be somebody at that front desk. I will actually have people there cleaning um, until nine, between nine okay. and 10. So what are the hours there's no one on site but the dogs? Between 10 and 5.45 to 6 a.m. So what happens if something happens? So um, there, there are multiple safeguards in front in, in terms of, um, there's a burglar alarm, um, motion detect, no, <laughs> Dogs. You're going to push a burglar alarm? No, I, yes, sir. That there will be motion detectors, which, um, and so I described it incorrectly. Motion detectors, which if a dog gets up out of their crate and starts, or gets up from the crate sleeping position, they will trigger a motion. I will get called. If there's a fire, if there is uh, water leakage. So um, we, do, we do have a- uh, All those things seem to be to protect your property and these fine animals, no. but what about protecting the neighbors? So um, I, I, what I would say is the dog daycares that I'm aware of in the national area also do not have personnel overnight because of the- But they are 200 feet away from private residences. Not all of them. Um, even she quoted earlier 220, so from the same measurements we had, and we may be using some different software, but the corner of uh, Southpaw to the residents that she mentioned, I have 190, which is very close. Also, Dog Spot in East Nashville on Gallup Gallatin Avenue is less than 100 feet, and they were zoned and approved, um, and so they're closer to a home. So, and I actually take my dog to Dog Spot, and they have also stayed overnight in the past. So, um, 
anything could happen if we are making plans to take care of them, but those are situations okay. where so not all dog so parks the are The second big point, the smell. Where do you That's dispose right. of waste and how often does it get picked up? So our odor protocols are very stringent. We actually triple bag, not single bag, like the chicken in the, uh, the bag. You're, you're just putting it in a bag with a bunch of other stuff and, and then you take it out to your dumpster. The um, uh, solid waste is picked up with a bag in the playroom. That bag is tied off and put inside a bag in the playroom, which at the end of the day with the other bags collected is tied off. And then that bag is put into another bag before it's put into the dumpster. And that goes into a dumpster that the pickup is how many times a week? I, what I said was um, I would do a minimum of two times a week and I will do more if the odor is a problem. Um, I had There are additional protocols that can be taken if odor is a problem. There's a reason why we have 80 of these and the odor hasn't been a problem. We're going to do, I'm going to do what's needed to make sure that that's not an issue. You keep on talking about the franchise of this, and mm -hmm. I'm sure they are in all other cities, but this is your first uh, one that's, you've never run one of these before, right? I have not run a Dogtopia. I have one on Hickory Plaza that is going to be opening in the next couple of weeks. So you speak of all these things, but you know, it's just still, you don't particularly know, definitely. Well, I, here's what I do know. The South Paul says it's on 8th Avenue was kicked out of the franchise because they were not adhering to the cleaning protocols and the odor and the sound. There were some financial issues as well. So what I would tell you is if I'm not doing it, they will boot me out before you guys even try to get rid of my permit. And we have, I have a question. What is the capacity? the dog capacity at this facility? So um, the capacity is driven by a, a lot of things. For me, the number one determiner of capacity will be what we can safely manage for the dog's safety and for the uh, protocols that we've just talked about in terms of odor and sound. Um, there are 4,898 square feet feet at Pia's place. I have not made the additional expense. I, I do want to respond to the expense. And can lack, you give me a range? I mean, is it 20 dogs, 80 dogs? It'll be more than 20. I couldn't even pay the rent with 20. Okay. Um, what I don't know is it's all based on how much play area space I'll be able to have once we design the space. So it, it, is, it is a difficult question to answer. I also don't, I have started lease negotiations. Those aren't final. I don't know what all the costs are. I mean, this so, is a, that's a really important question, though. Don't you think for the neighbors how many dogs are going to be there? How many dogs can you have at Old Hickory Plaza and it's 2000? Thousand square feet more. So at Hickory Plaza, oh, I wait a minute. We, we don't care about what the. No, she was just asking because it's we more. We want to know how many are at this place. Yes, and I understand. So um, I don't have an exact number to get the board. I I probably in excess of sixty, less than one hundred and fifty. But it, I know that's a wide range and it doesn't make you happy. Um, but but part of it will be what kind of dogs do we have? I can have a whole lot more Pomeranians or ones that are sure. quiet dogs. And if I have big, if I have a lot of Great Danes, I can have a whole lot fewer dogs. I understand that it would fluctuate. And so the overnight capacity would be what? Is that a different place in the facility that houses the dogs overnight? No, the uh, the overnight dogs are in the same playrooms that they play all day because dogs are comfortable and so familiar with So that range would be exactly the same? No, I won't have room for 150 crates okay. in the facility. I do not know yet until I get my playrooms laid out what my uh, overnight capacity will be. I mean, don't you think there's a better place for you where you can have an outside play area than this location? Let me um, turn, I'll turn this over to, to Liz, who's my real estate agent. I, can, no, the, I can speak to that. So we've been in search and I've actually been contacted by other uh, doggy daycares across the country just because I have a tendency to work with them. Um, the way the zoning is currently set up, it does not actually allow for you easily to open a kennel or a daycare with current zoning under CS or IWD, DTZ or DTZ. DTC is the easiest one to do inside the inner loop. Um, what we've come to find is areas that would probably be better slightly suited, landlords would not want to lease to us because A, we're going to redevelop the land in downtown Nashville within the next two or three years. And due to the expense of building out these types of structures, um, amortization of the cost over the course of the term, they require, even with their franchise agreements, tenure leases with options to renew. So there are factors within the scale 
of the business and how we build out the spaces to accommodate the dogs. So in our search, we actually had submitted seven different LOIs, um, and due to the nature of us trying to apply to be in areas that are not typically um, fitting with Nashville's current zoning or Brentwood or Franklin um, with that matter. Uh, these types of businesses are going into more traditional customer retail residential areas because we don't want to have to drive out to Natchez Trace to drop our dogs off. So we're trying to be convenient. We did look for other opportunities, but there's only so many places on the market that are willing to lease or even be patient enough as our current landlord has been to let us go through these procedures. I would, I would like to also say I purchased these franchises two years ago today to this month so for two years we have been looking for real estate Liz has evaluated thousands of properties I have looked at dozens of site visits which required a lot of cost and expense and seven LOIs it's not that we come to you with this because it was the first one we stumbled into it's the, real estate in Nashville is very difficult but to that's by. why it's really more concerning because it's a use that you're trying to force somewhere where it may not fit. And you've not come to us with any support, anybody saying, I live nearby, it would be great if I had this use uh, to be able to leave my dog here, either for the day or overnight. But we have quite the opposite. So I'm just trying to determine if this is really the best piece of property for the use that you're seeking. And, and I know you've put a lot of work into it. That's, that's not the question. But you don't have a lot of information for what, in my mind, and my colleagues may disagree, are very pertinent questions about how this facility would be run, and I can understand their concern. Is that still a question, or am I responding to Well, your I guess what I would say is, if you have something to add that would address my concerns, yeah. I'm happy to hear it. So is the concern... So you don't know how many dogs are going to be there. Right. Um, I don't. But I, exactly for this facility. And what I don't want to do is state that there's going to be 80, and they end up coming back, and there's 84, and now there's another issue. Um, but what I would provide as, as evidence is that we do have facilities in strip malls next to um, residences with 80 and 100 dogs but and there those aren't are issues. not in front of us today your case is right but I, but I'm providing trying to provide some evidence and we have a hundred uh, oh I'm sorry let me ask you this the opposition you you said earlier you're not gonna have an outdoor play area correct yes. mm -hmm. correct but the opposition said that the meeting you said that the dogs would be walked outside where are they gonna be walked and how often and, yeah. and how many my intent is not to walk dogs. The, the well, not indoor, you, but no, good. no, but I, no, I will be doing everything in this facility, believe me. My, but it's an indoor play area. It's designed for group play. However, with withdraw, the consideration is when you withdraw the outdoor play area, there are certain dogs, it's a very rare exception, that will not potty inside. And what I shared with the residences, resident, neighborhoods, neighbors, is that I will not take a dog, make it, hold it all day long, and get a kidney infection or a bladder okay, infection. So therefore, where would you take these dogs in this? So um, th we could walk down the street like the neighbors do, but what we're talking about. No, but is it going to be in the alley? Is it gonna, where is it going to be? We have tell a grassy us, knoll directly next to the building that's right. accessible, or you could direct us if you wanted right. something different. I'm, that's why I just wanted to say I'm more than willing to go wherever somebody wants us to. What I'm not willing to do is keep a dog confined all day that's going to get a medical issue. That's we do have a grassy patch to the left of the building that's accessible, and Pia Stratton's sister actually also owns the lot next door, which there's no intent to currently use her lot or to lease that, but um, they are connected, and so there is a shared grassy section between the middle of the building that's closer to 8th Avenue and the structure that uh, jo uh, Joni is here trying to, to lease out. So the intent is not to walk them because, A, that takes away from your staff that's going to be managing the property, but there are some cases where you would have to release one animal or the other if they will not utilize the interior. I would give building. you a data point. I spent a week in Tyson's Corner, our busiest um, facility I talked about before. There were 580 dogs that were in the facility over that week. They had one dog that needed to be walked. So this is not a significant issue um, in terms of how many dogs will be walked outside. Any more questions of the applicant? I, oh, I do, actually. Um, well, one is, 
you know, for a variance, this is a special exception mm -hmm. and a variance request, and the variance request is on the separation distance. Mm -hmm. okay. So what would be your hardship? You would have to state a hardship for us, for, so we would even be able to. I think for a kennel, it's, it's like a church. It's, it's um, Well, it's written up as a B and a C, so I, I think the variance, and it says variance from minimum separation requirements. John is nodding. Basically, the variance is from condition number one described under the special exception language. Absent the variance, they do not meet the qualifications according to the application, therefore would not be eligible for the special exception. I direct your attention back to the planning department's recommendation, which basically said disapproval unless the variance is granted, in which case they recommend approval. So that's um, my first question is what would your hardship be? So the, the, the hardship is, um, is surrounding um, trying to um, meet the, neighbor, the, the community need that um, there is a significant demand for these in the neighborhood, in the, in the community, um, as evidenced by the lack of availability for uh, the community, um, for the resource. Um, I would also like to address the fact that one of the things that were outlined in terms of hardship is that there isn't um, evidence to, that there is going to be an impact to, to health or comfort or safety issues. Um, and I do think we do have evidence to say that we can deal with the protocols that we've talked about. Um, I, I, the, the biggest um, hardship is the, the, the lack of availability of locations that yeah, meet. That is not a hardship as it relates to this board. It has to be something. Well, the hardship with. here is that, that it's the distance would you not agree that we all, we lack about, we're about 50, on the closest point, we're 50 feet too close to the jut out of that That is building. why you have to have a hardship. So why is there? So could you just help <laughs> outline what you do consider a hardship? John Michael, give us a drill on what a hardship is related to our rules. The shortest version without reading law to the largely disinterested audience here is that the hardship has to do with the condition of the land. It may be the narrowness of the lot shown here on the zoning map. It may be something about the unique topography of the lot. It may be something about the pre attempt to preserve very old, large, important trees on a lot. It may be a creek dividing the lot nearly in half because of the unique uh, flow of water. But it has to do with the land. That's a hardship. And obviously, to the appellant's credit, they've not tried to say, oh, because of the financial hardship that would be imposed upon us if we didn't have this variance, that would never be in its, in, on its sole basis a proper hardship. But these other land-based examples would be examples under the zoning code. And, and and John, do you know if the apartment building, uh, you, I, I'm asking you a question on the spot, but uh, the, the apartment building that is the closest, do you have any uh, knowledge of it being closer to the alley than its uh, legal setback? I don't have knowledge on that one way or the other. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions for the yes. applicants? Um, second question is getting back to the waste. I'm reading from the zoning code 17.16.175A, um, item number 10, and it talks about on waste collection. And it says on, all on site waste shall be housed either within the kennel building or an accessory structure. Um, it didn't sound like, and while you're bagging three times and putting in another bag, that might be well and good, but it didn't sound like it met the requirements. Um, that you need to meet to be granted the special exception? So so there would be a structure that the dumpster would be in? Is that the structure you're referring to? I'm so not sure what I don't structure think you're referring to. I had no, and I couldn't even hear what code, I haven't heard familiar. Yeah. And, and when you come before us, you have to meet these um, conditions. Right. Now some conditions don't apply because they're for right. horses. I just couldn't hear which one you were mm -hmm. referring to. Okay, it is 17.16.175. Um, section A, number 10. Okay. Oh, I think I left that back. But, um, so it's the, the, the waste. I, I will do whatever is needed to, to meet that. There is not currently a structure for the dumpster at Pia's. I would construct one. I would also um, submit that I can um, house the waste inside the facility until the day that trash is, is picked up. Um, to do so, I would... Um, I have a deep freezer, which is used in some of our other facilities that are set um, closer to residential areas to eliminate those exact concerns. 
Can I, can I respond? Oh. Respond to what? I still have four minutes on yeah, my. Okay, okay, I just wanted to make sure I thought you were getting ready to close. And, um, so I, I do, I would like to talk about the size of the opposition and um, no um, pros, <laughs> should I first say, um, the, the people with the 100,000 dogs, I can't have any way to find them all or, or bring them here. And people, what I can tell you is the number of calls I'm getting for my other one that you don't want to hear about is over and over people who can't find daycare in downtown Nashville. So I, there is a community hardship, whether that's recognized or will be recognized by the board. Um, I would also say that of all those people who opposed seven people, three three of which are all of one family, showed up at the meeting to even discuss their concerns. I would put forth that they don't even understand what I was able to describe to the group in the meeting, and there still are two people that were at the meeting who are here still opposed, but I would put forth they are the same as the people here who oppose B &B, Airbnbs. They, don't, they either don't like dogs or they don't want them in their neighborhood, but, but nothing is going to persuade them, and I don't think the other people People understand the soundproofing, the data that there is that others are operating without issue, and I will operate my facility to the full strict 180-page Dogtopia standards model that you have to, or I will be booted out and I will leave. Um, so I, I would put forth that those issues that have been brought forth have and are addressed in the Dogtopia standards model, manual. I'd be happy to bring you a copy of it if you'd like to do it for some leisure reading, um, but um, it, I, I, there is data, I think, to support um, a variance to the, the, the closeness given what we have done. And um, I thank you for the time. Okay. In okay. Let's close the public hearing discussion. I have a question for Mr. Michael. Um, it would help me to think about this case if you could tell me what other uses could occur on this property uh, without someone coming to the board, just so I have a good idea. Can we get a MAPCO? Are there smelly and loud operations that can occur that might not come with a there's entrepreneurial, a, friendly yeah, neighbor? There's a U-Haul next door, which obviously is limited to certain areas of town, too. Th that's correct. Ms. Chapel. here's the simplest way to describe it. This is a CS, Commercial Services Zone property. Nearly every commercial use defined under the land use table is allowable in CS zone property, uh, either permitted or permitted with conditions. I want to make sure I'm not saying this incorrectly before I launch. The only specifically identified commercial use under the entire land use table, and here we're talking about, I don't know, maybe three dozen defined uses that is allowed only as a special exception use happens to be kennel slash stable, the one that we're looking at. The other commercial uses specifically identified as potentially eligible under CS zoning include ATM, auction house, automobile convenience, automobile parking, automobile repair, automobile sales, new, automobile sales, used, automobile service, bar, nightclub, bed and breakfast inn, beer and cigarette market. Bo uh, boat storage is not permitted in CS zoning, uh, however. Uh, carpet cleaning, car wash, community gardening, community gardening, non-commercial, custom assembly, donation center, flea market, funeral home, furniture store, grocery store, home improvement sales, hotel, motel, inventory stock, the previously referenced kennel slash stable, laundry plant, liquor sales, major appliance repair, and then that's only about halfway through the alphabet of uses. Thank you. So, as I understand it, without coming before the board, as long as they met with other requirements under the code, all of those types of uses are allowed on this piece of property. That's right. The only reason this type of use is required to go to a board, as long as they're in the right zoning district, is because it's a special exception use, which specifically requires board approval. Okay. Thank you. Well, to me, this, it, it it all boils down to uh, kind of two things. Uh, one, uh, one thing, but a couple questions. It's it's the distance. It's that 150 feet versus 200 feet. And does the elimination of an outdoor play area warrant that additional 50 feet? And the planning department has said, you know that. You know, it should be 200 feet, and unless you grant the variance, uh, you should deny it. So they basically are saying if we feel like there's some mitigating circumstance or hardship that would allow that 
to be 150 feet versus 200 feet, then it's perfectly appropriate. If, if we say that there's a that there's a need for a variance, that you know they say a daycare is perfectly appropriate here, except for the 200 feet. So to me, it all really comes down to the, the 200 feet, and 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 I understand the. And, and definitely understand and, and appreciate the the, the odor uh, concern. Um, uh, to me, that one has been addressed, and also, you know, given the other options that it could be. I mean, you know, do, do, you know, do I want a Mapco dumpster in my back parking lot, or a nightclub dumpster, or do I want a, you know, dog? I may I may not want any dumpster, you know, close to me. But I don't know that this dumpster is worse than 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 others, especially given the testimony. So to me, it really comes down to that 150 feet and others may see it differently, but um, I think the negation of the plate pin does have an impact, although I wish that I had a little more details on the soundproofing. Um, although I, we got, you know, y'all y'all heard and I may, you know, the, the one inch air barrier, the insulation and all that. Um, I'm also concerned by the number, the fact that we don't have a more specific number. If someone came in front of us and wanted to build something and they couldn't tell us how tall it was or whatever, it's just, this is pretty material, how many dogs is it? She said between 60 and 150, well that's a big swing. I also, and maybe this is standard for the industry, I don't know, that between the hours of 10 and 5 a.m. there's nobody on site and there could be 150 dogs. I just think that if you have that many, there are some issues that would come up that you need somebody here and technology doesn't necessarily immediately solve all of those. Well, I had a, another zoning question. Sorry to put you all to work, but um, number one that we've been talking about a lot it says no part of any building or structure in which animals are housed shall be closer than 200 feet. Then it goes on to say, and no kennel run shall be located within 100 feet from an existing residence. What's it, what exactly, how is kennel run defined in the zoning code? Is that an indoor? It's not. Not. Okay, so that could be indoor or outdoor. I think that logic dictates it is probably presumed to be outdoor because you're talking about, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, it's not specified under the zoning code, and we're not always quick to assume what the drafters meant. <laughs> and, I, and, and I might rather have it reversed, you know, I'd rather have the kennel run further away than the indoor. Right, right, that's the confusing thing to me, but maybe is the differentiator, I don't know. Any more discussion? Does anyone have a motion? I think a church would also require special exception in this zoning. So churches and dogs and horses. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually think that you take away the outside play area, and I think, you know, soundproofing in a building is not mm -hmm. rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we soundproof structures all the time, generally to keep sound out, like churches or recording studios. So I don't, I don't think that's a mystery how to, how to achieve that. And <clears throat> frankly, the difference between 50 and 100 dogs sound wise that won't make a difference. Well, the thing that also bothers me, and part of the special exception is supposed to have, you know, community input, and the community spoke pretty loudly. Um, I'm not even going to go by their 186, you know, people in opposition, but we have about 20 emails in opposition uh, saying that they don't want this, that live nearby. And as we talked earlier, there's not one person that lives over there that says they want this. And when we have a special exception, and you talk about the impact on the neighbors, we've heard pretty loud and clear that these neighbors don't want it. Yes, but I do still want to point out they probably don't want the nightclub either. I mean, I just want to be mindful. I, I don't think the applicant has as much information, enough information to make me quite comfortable. At the same time, uh, she does appear to want to be a good neighbor in terms of, and I do think she has knowledge in the industry, 
uh, and experience in the industry. And I just want to think about overall, if we put something there with, as a special exception, we have a lot of control over how we determine that it's going to be operated. Whereas if we deny this application, uh, the community has much less control over what happens. And I just think that's worth pointing out. Well, it seems like there's a, you know, one potential is we, we can vote right now and we can uh, somewhat arbitrarily put our own conditions Not on. Not arbitrarily. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying it would be somewhat. I mean, we could. And, this board and, and does this not operate arbitrarily. You might not agree with somebody's <laughs> ruling, but there's a right. Well, we don't have any input. That that goes to my point. If if we made a motion and or if if we approved it with conditions, we don't have the input to appropriately make uh, the conditions. I mean, we can say 50 dogs, but there's there's no testimony that tells us it ought to be 50 dogs or that it. Well, she just said she didn't know, and well, obviously she's trying to maximize so, the use of this site. So to the to the second point of that is we, we could defer it, and she could come back with a more solid proposal that we could then say we're willing to grant it with these conditions. What do people think about that? What do you think, Mr. Taylor? I, I agree with uh, with David Harper that uh, that sound briefing is possible. I do agree that um, an odor control protocol can be defined. Um, I do believe that the technology is, you know, that that uh, you know, saying, you know, we'd like to see some type of plan of how dogs are monitored at, you know after hours uh, whether it's you know through video camera or some type of sensor that you know that says you know any issues can be addressed uh, in a reasonable way or, or have maybe a little more indication that, that what what the norm is all those I think are easy for the applicant to answer and and, and get um, I think they would help in the, in, in this um, you know I mean on one hand you're looking at well what are what are potential worst things that that could be? Um, you know, I do think it's on the high side of people complaining, but I do think that the complaints, as described in the letters, are I don't want a kennel, I don't want the outside, and I think it's I think that taking away the outside makes it a different question, and. I think that it is possible to have a kennel here and have the neighbors not even know it's a kennel because of the if, if it's soundproofed appropriately and the dogs aren't outside. Um, and, and if that's the case, then I think that negates a lot of the concern and community impact that's expressed. Um, I mean, and it, uh, it satisfies. I don't want to say negate or, or imply that it's not. Their, their concerns aren't important, but I, it would satisfy. If you don't know it's there, it's not, not a problem. So I, I don't know, I, I, I do. Let me read to you one of the letters that we received from a neighbor, Herb Spivak. I'm opposed to the pro proposed use of the property on 1802 8th Avenue South as a kennel for the following reasons. The noise level from the animals boarded there will be a problem as the building is not soundproof. We talked about that. The boarded animals will need to be walked, which creates a potential problem with waste. The areas behind, adjacent, and otherwise close to the property will have a negative impact on real estate values. So, there's... Well, but, you know, they, the applicant addressed the walking and the waste and said, you know, it's maybe two dogs a day, which the the neighbors have said, are, certainly they didn't put a number, but implied, you know, people walk their dogs all the time down the alley, so that would imply more than one or two dogs a day. Um, but to me, the burden the burden's on the applicant because, you know, this use needs, um, it's different from what the code allows. So and, all I'm saying is, and they have not that. met that as far as really concrete how they're going to do all of this. It's just like, you know, even the waste thing. You brought up the fact of the container. I think they were just going to just throw it in a dumpster and triple bag it. 
and under the code, you need a special, you know, some sort of structure. Well, I would like to have you think about what Ms. Chapel asked, and that is, uh, we know without anyone even coming here, we could have someone use that property to put in a nightclub. That well, would certainly devalue the Well, property. there's the basement right down the street, the basement. I'm Which, aware. Uh, not for long, but that, is, that has been kind of a, but you know, people like that. I'm just saying that. with the, the businesses that are allowed without any exception, uh, this one might be less egregious than some others that could come there. Just, I just want to... I just don't think that we have enough detail in here with things like waste and noise to make a favorable recommendation. I agree we need more from the applicant. Um, we can't, like uh, Mr. Harper said, make up um, conditions which would seem arbitrary, number of dogs and things like that. So in order, if we were to approve it, we would need something in writing from the applicant addressing every single point that was discussed today. Um, also throw out that people in Nashville have dogs and they walk dogs all the time. And the testimony was that not the dogs wouldn't be walked that often. So it almost seemed like it would be just like someone walking the dog in the neighborhood. I, you know, someone in the neighborhood who owns a dog wa walking a dog. Um, so that's something maybe to be considered. You well, didn't substantially increase dog traffic. That was sort of my impression. Yes. So I'll move that we defer the case uh, until the August 2nd meeting. Uh, and at that time, uh, we... Can we do the second meeting in July, or is that... Why did you want August 2nd? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, That'd be a that's my birthday, David. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to point that out. Uh, I, let's see. This is the second meeting of this month. Yes. So let, let's say the second meeting of July, that gives them a month. Mm -hmm. They, in, uh, so the motion is, I move that we defer this to the second meeting in July and that time uh, we'll reopen the public hearing to hear their, uh, their proposal for the conditions for us to consider granting. And, uh, and if we, I'm assuming if we open, the public hearing will we'll let the opposition respond to the conditions. But, the, and, but specifically, we're asking for the soundproofing plan. The waste plan. Sound, the soundproofing, waste, waste, hours of operation, and... Number of dogs. Number of dogs. And number of dogs, which I, I in my uh, motion, say we will... We, we will entertain a range of dogs because it's... A range within 20. Okay. Well, what did you think about the proposal that the waste could be frozen? I've never thought about anything like that. <laughs> Wasn't that a... Well, that, that's we part, that'll be part of the waste, or part of the proposal of what they'll do. Okay. And the walking issue, if there's going to be dogs walked or not, and, and when and, and where. Protocol. And the walking okay. protocol. That is my motion. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second, but can I make an amendment? Sure. Uh, can I uh, make a, a friendly yes. amendment? I would like um, all of this to be in writing. Good. I'll accept that. Okay, okay. And one more question. It. You did mention about the um, sound. Mm -hmm. how they're yep, yeah. sound. Thank you. Okay, so second. Motion's been made in properly second, and I will add to that that they need to have another community meeting with the council person. I'll accept that. Okay. Well, and, and, and I think that's to their, it, it, to everyone's advantage. I mean, obviously we want the neighborhood advantage, but it's to their advantage also so that they can clearly articulate not only the plan they're bringing to us with that meets those sound and, and odor noises, but it also communicates to the neighbors that we're not talking about an outdoor area at all, and, and that might actually alleviate some of the neighborhood concern. It may not alleviate, they may still have just a strong Don't concern. Don't you think it should be set on a date that's not Father's Day? Yes. Okay. Yes. Not, okay. not a holiday. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? 
passes, we'll hear this in July. The next case to be presented to the board is case number 2018-275. That's a case involving Timo 6 LLC, the appellant, on behalf of True Development LLC, the owner of the property at 1807 12th Avenue North, North Nashville, Council District number 21, on the aerial map shown here for the zoning district in R6 district. An arrow here. Ladies and gentlemen, if we could respectfully ask everyone to please quietly exit the auditorium if you are in fact leaving so we can continue with the cases for the board. If the appellant will please come forward, this is a request for a sidewalk variance for single family construction as shown on the site plan here. And from the recent site visit, the view up and down 12th Avenue North and the current condition of the existing sidewalk. Great, the appellants are present. Is there any opposition to case number 275? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Please just introduce yourselves by name and address. Hi, yes, my name is Michael Bolton with Timo 6 LLC. I'm the construction manager and I live at 2137 Fairfax Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Hi, I'm Matthew Bolton. I am the managing member of Timo 6 and uh, we're here today regarding this property at 1807-12. Okay, get us started. Why are we here? Uh, we're here for we're here for three reasons. Um, primary, I'd like to present the hardship, which is the preservation of the community and the neighborhood, um, and from some things that have been expressed by them. Um, the three reasons we think we should be granted this variance is one, because the existing condition of the sidewalk being excellent, and two, that it's not very old. Um, how, and it, how old is it? Uh, just, it looks just, like at least twenty or thirty years old to me. Okay, well, and, and then so somewhere in that range probably, I guess, but um, other it sidewalks- like they were built in the Fulton administration. Uh, so I didn't know, I don't know, I don't know how to look it up that well. They just, from general construction knowledge, looking at the condition they're in, it did not seem like they were, they were very weathered in general. Um, but third, and the primary reason being uh, concerns expressed by people in the community, specifically the neighbor to the left of the unit, and a, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Keith, who mows most of the yards in the area, um, protesting to the idea of the deviation in the trajectory of the sidewalk. But based on what? Uh, they, they rather not um, have the sidewalk on either side that's the same all the way down the entire block be different but than it is. You, you understand our sidewalk ordinance, that's what yeah, it says. So yes, sir, absolutely. Um, and we were advised by uh, certain examiners to to seek a variance just just because okay. of the lack of Well, necessity. if we give you a variance, are you willing to pay in the sidewalk fund? Uh, we're willing to, uh, we'd be more than willing to construct the sidewalks the way they need to be done. Absolutely. We're not really too concerned about it as much as um, the neighborhood's concerned for it. That's really why we're oh, here. So you're willing to build it the way it is. You just think your neighbors don't want it that way. So yes, that's sir. why you're asking us. Yeah, technically. Okay. Questions for the applicant? Yeah, so if we disapprove that you build it like it is, it's are you are any of the are, yes, sir, sir. are any of these people here today? No, sir, they're not. Build, to my okay. and we don't have any letters from anybody. I don't think. No, no sir. I, I doubt Mr. Keith sent in a letter. Okay. So, any other questions for the applicant? What you're saying is it's cheaper to build the sidewalk to code than pay into the fund? Absolutely, and that's, that's the action we would take. And discussing that with the few people I've spoken to in the neighborhood, they didn't want us to do that. I know, I really, I hope the council will take that up. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? Let's close the public hearing discussion. Thank you. Uh, I see no reason to, to approve. Okay, make a motion. Uh, I move that we deny the uh, the appeal uh, in case 218-275. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? second. Motion's been made and properly second. Any discussion? Yes. I, I would echo Ms. Chappelle's Okay. Comment. Seeing no, uh, no more discussion, um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay. We appreciate your Next time. Case. Can we take a really Okay, quick John break? Michael, break. We'll take a break before reconvening with case number 2018-303.
2018-303, here from the outset. Uh, the case involves the property at 704 South 14th Street, Council District Number 6. Board members, you'll recall you've already heard from Council Member Withers with regard to this case. Gray Enterprises is the appellant on behalf of the owners of the property. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements for the property shown here in the aerial photograph. The site plan submitted shows the proposed layout for the construction, uh, house in its current uh, condition from the assessor's website photography, and the condition of the sidewalks at the existing property. We'll note the uh, knee wall there at the outer edge of the sidewalk to the interior of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 303? Seeing no one, the appellants will have uh, five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Please come forward and introduce yourselves by name and address, and then make your desired presentation to the board. Good afternoon, my name is Kate Dominguez and this is my husband, Adam Lemons. We are here to speak about the property at 704 South 14th Street um, that Councilman Withers um, had first spoken about and we are in complete agreement with what he stated but also to um, add some further detail and history on how we ended up here. So in January of this year, we found out that we were um, expecting our second little boy um, due in August this summer. And we, at the, well, at the time we were already, um, we had already grown outside of, or outgrown our current home. And so we started looking for another home in the East Nashville neighborhood where we we're located because we love it and don't want to move outside of there, um, and so given our budget constraints and the house that we needed, um, we're a little bit disappointed in what we were finding. So we started looking at expanding our current home where we are, which is adjacent to 704 South 14th Street at 702, and also seemed like a daunting task. So our, um, at the time, our current neighbors at 704 South 14th Street offered um, an opportunity that we couldn't resist in at least uh, exploring in um, selling us the property and then also managing the construction of the home that we wanted to build um, and the budget that we had for it. So after much due diligence and probably to the horror of our builder, Sam Gray, we examined the budget and every detail down to the last dollar and um, then approved and signed off on it and closed on the property in which we found out that there was a sidewalk, um, I guess you would call ordinance, um, on the property that would add a significant amount um, to the budget that we had already approved and signed off on. Um, in, um, in addition to that, I, we were a little bit surprised in that, as you can see from the pictures, and we've also submitted some added detail and letter and additional photos as well as our neighbors have. Um, that we were surprised in that we share a retaining wall with our current property now, as well as a shared driveway with the other, uh, our new next door neighbors. Um, but also in that, moving the sidewalk back another five feet would also probably, we are assuming, would impact the very large, beautiful tree in our front yard. Um, we also use the sidewalk quite extensively with our dog and um, 50, almost 15 month old now. Um, so do believe that it is a functioning sidewalk that there is not any reason to change. In addition to um, requesting the variance, as Councilman Member um, Withers stated, we are also requesting to waive the in lieu of fee, given that it is extensive, given the topographical conditions, um, the fee would, uh, that fee would cover our son Bishop's daycare for a year, or um, all of the windows and exterior doors on our future home project. Um, which is why we are asking for the board to please consider um, the variance as well as waiving the in lieu of fee. Adam, do you have anything okay. else that you'd like to state? Uh, I do not have anything else to add other than I just want to thank the board for their time. Uh, okay. Those are on a volunteer basis. So. Questions for the applicant? What's the amount of your in lieu of fee, please? Uh, we've been notified that it's around $8,900. $8,900? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay, close the public hearing. 
discussion. This was a case that Councilman Withers called a rare case, and he said that he wanted us to give them the variance and not have them pay into the in-lieu fund. Um, I'll, I'll make a motion that we grant the variance uh, for the sidewalk requirement based on the hardship of the existing retaining wall and potential harm to the mature tree, as well as the fact that there's an existing sidewalk that has a grass strip and that uh, there not be a payment, there will not be a payment into the sidewalk fund. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I would second the motion, but I would make the statement the only reason that I approve waiving the in lieu fee is because the councilman came down personally to ask for it. I think right. otherwise, because the council approved this unanimously, uh, that in lieu fee should be paid. That's, but I support I, your I, motion. I agree with you too that the councilman came down here and very strongly and as he cried it, called it a rare case, so that's why I'd be in favor of it. Well, I also agree, and I think we all need to know something, we all know something has to be done about the in-lieu fund, but I'm sure I'll be the only one that opposes it, and not because I don't feel for the applicants, but we have a lot of people that come here, and a lot of people have had to pay the in-lieu fee. So for me to be consistent, I'm just trying to be consistent with what everyone else is expected to do in Nashville. Any more discussion? Okay, we have our motion on the table. Um, all the, seconded it. Okay, motion's been made and properly second. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? It passes um, five to one. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board is 2018-306 involving the property at 2711 Ackland Avenue. This is a request for a variance from height restrictions in residentially zoned district for construction of a two-story detached garage at the property shown here on the aerial map. This is in council district number 18. The elevation submitted gives some um, indication of the proposed layout for the structure at issue. From my recent site visit, the base of the property in the lower right-hand corner, the view across the street in the upper left, view up and down the sidewalk on this slide. Uh, Jonathan Street is the appellant and owner of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 306? Seeing none, Mr. Street will have five minutes to make the desired presentation of the board. Sir, just please introduce yourself by name and address. Press the button, please. Press the button, this is the red light, okay? My name is Jonathan Street. I live at 2711 Acklin Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm here today asking for a variance from the code requirement, which would limit the height of a uh, standalone garage I wanted to build on the back of my home, or the back of my house. And I feel like the, the, the problem that I'm facing is because my property actually has a flat roof if it were to be required to meet the strict zoning requirement, I could only build the garage 16 feet, and I wanted to put a room on top of it where I could use for storage. I've got, I'm a lawyer, I have a lot of old legal files. Uh, <laughs> as, as Ms. Chaplin knows us, that we have, a, uh, we have a lot of paperwork we have to keep, and I just don't have room downtown to keep it there. So uh, that kind of thing also, I, I, I run out of room to, to put a bed in there for somebody if they want to stay. Won't be a shower, won't be a kitchen, it's not gonna be a for rent, it's not an apartment. It's just a simple garage with a room over top of it. And again, I feel like uh, the unique characteristics of my home, uh, given that the lot is so slim, that you kind of have to go up to have room for anything in this particular neighborhood. Uh, and also the flat roof on my home, which is uh, recently built, it's a very modern design, and you, know, you couldn't do a, uh, a, a slant, a slanted roof, because it just wouldn't look proper in this modern home. Uh, so the code allows for, uh, you can build 16 feet and then continue up the slant of your roof and even gable it out so you could have a lot of room if I had a slanted roof. But because of a flat roof, I'm stuck at 16 feet. I feel like the, uh, the code provision here is to prevent someone from building a secondary structure that would actually be taller than their main residence. And that's not what I'm seeking to do here at all. And so what I'm asking is not going to violate the spirit of this code. It's not going to uh, allow the situation which this code was designed to prevent to occur all it's going to do is allow me to build a standalone garage, which my neighbors behind me have been able to do, and I've included a picture in my uh, filing as well. Uh, it's not going to affect any of my neighbor's property uh, in, in a bad way. Uh, there's certainly nothing to harm public welfare by, building, by allowing this variance. 
and uh, it does. There's no master design plan for the neighborhood, so I don't feel like it's going to affect the integrity of the neighborhood either. But so. you, can, you back up to that, though, right? I mean, Fairfax has Fairfax is in the historic overlay, but your street is not. So it's it's Ackland is one street over, and there's the alley right between. Fairfax no, I know. And I, know I mean, I know. I know the street. I know. Right. I know. Um, and, and, and I know the house. House looks great from the. Oh, thank you. From the street. Now, the only question I had. I mean, it. It, it says not for residential, but I mean, I, I mean, you, there's a. A drawing that shows a bed, a bathroom, a shower, and a kitchen. Well, the drawing shows a bath. This is a toilet. There will be a toilet and a sink. Well, no shower. Know, but it also has a shower drawn with a with a little dot for a drain hole. No, the shower's been taken out of the revised plans, and I think I apologize for well, the, I, the. The only plan I have is the one in front of me, and that shows a shower and a kitchen. <laughs> or it's a, so a, a, counselor, a sink, so. that looks a little different <laughs> than just stir, storing some old file boxes. Well, but I mean, it's, it's going to be your a intention room. here. It's going to be a room for people that can, an extra bedroom for my house. It's not going to have a shower, like I said, or a kitchen. It, it's not that we were initially, and when we talked to the coach, so is it said, a bedroom or a storage? Well, I mean, I, I want to be able to use it for both. You know, it's only going to be. I have two extra bedrooms in the house, but if you have need three, then someone may sleep out there with the files. <laughs> but the the, bad, the the shower has been taken off the plans. It's not going to happen. We we're not appealing. You're not going to put one in on the future. No, we're not planning on putting that. And if we do, we'll come back. But I, I have no plans to do that right no, now. No, no plans to. No, no, I have no intention to. I mean, I I don't know if somebody buys the house what they want to do, but I don't have any plans to do that. Okay. And if a shower was in there in the future and you own the property, what would you say about that? I would not allow a shower to be built in there without coming before this board and asking for it. I mean, I guess, you know, the, and, and I'd, I mean, the, maybe the architects have say, uh, better say, and I'm used to questions in, uh, the historic, in the historic part of the neighborhood, which it backs up to. Uh, but that 16 feet, I think, is just to give a much more impression of it being a garage and not this kind of massive wall you're walking next to. Um, but, you know, you kind of need it to get your square feet of footage. I understand that. And, uh, the Fairfax and the other streets that are in the historic overlay, you know, have to kind of solve that problem differently, I guess. With well, but, uh, I don't know, I guess. Well, I'm trying I, to doubt, I with doubt this house question. would be a historic overlay, so it, it's mm. the problem would not present itself. No, it, well, it's not, other than it's the, the, the requirement 16 feet, which, you know, it's struggling with the hardships, what I'm trying to figure out. The, I'm sorry, the what? The, the, the hardship. I mean, it, you know, it, I understand the aesthetics, I understand, and, and I agree with you on that. Well, I'm not disagreeing with you on, on the reasoning. But well, that the reasoning isn't the hardship, you know. I mean, it's it's saying it's not, you know. Everybody else solves that issue, the problem that they don't have a, a the type of modern house you do, but they 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 solve it within those constraints. And I understand that. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm gonna say your honor. I apologize, Mr. Taylor. But they, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Taylor. I understand that. But but the thing is, you know, this code provision is designed for a specific purpose. It's to allow not people not to have garages which stand like you said, look like a big wall taller than the main house. I'm not looking to do that. Allowing me this variance isn't going to cause something to happen that whoever passed this code didn't want to happen. All it's going to do is prevent me from using my property as I want to. I think that's a that's a hardship in itself. But I think if you look at the uh, design of the, the lots as well, that's the only way you can do this. And I'm not asking to do something in this property that's not legal. I'm just asking for a seven-foot variance is all I'm asking for. Well, the reason you're asking for a variance is because it's not legal. Well, it doesn't comply with the code. You're right. It doesn't. It doesn't comply so with the code. Without what our approval, is. you can't build right. it. Right. So with the exception of this variance, I mean, let me re back myself up there. <laughs> without this variance, when, so if I get this variance, then it's not going to be illegal at all. Nothing about it is going to be in violation of any codes. I'm only asking for seven feet. And I'm just not sure that the. Uh, uh, so what about his question about a hardship? And you heard. Mr. John Michael's quest uh, earlier talking about the physical characteristics of the land right. being what is required. I, and I, I appreciate it. The physical characteristics are because the lots are so narrow on Ackland. And if you look at the picture that I provided in my filings, that the, uh, the, the, the very large detached garage is beautiful, but it's huge, is on Fairfax. Uh, and it's right behind me. 
Oh. I'm talking about on Ackland, and uh, the very nature of this lot's so small, I'm just not able to do it. I would have to build, I guess, from the house to the garage to get this room. Uh, and uh, but you're, you're, asking, you're asking for a height variance. Right. And so, and we've gone round and round and talking about what this second story is really going to be. Well, I've so told what's you what it's really going to be. I'm not lying. Okay, well, no, but why do, you, why do you need it? I mean, what's the hardship? Why do I need, I need this room? No, but what's the hardship? The hardship is unless I'm allowed to go high, then I'm not able to build this additional room where someone who had a larger lot certainly would be able to build a, build a, a more spread out and have the room they needed to build this. The height and, is and, and the neighborhood that we're in. Add on the only way to build them. Right you couldn't there. add on to your house? No. I mean, it's almost, the, there's, no, I don't think so. Well, I mean, he could put a pitched roof on his house. I right. Guess. I mean, you're talking about tearing my roof off and putting a new roof on. Okay. I mean, I think okay. that's what he's saying. Right. I mean, it's kind of the very kind of arbitrary number roof, there. So. He would be able to achieve what he's trying to achieve. But because he has a flat roof, he's not able to do that. Other questions for the applicant? Any, anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. Let's close the public hearing. Discussion. See, I think this falls under the extraordinary circumstances because of the architectural style of the house. It would, it would be inappropriate to, to he could he, he could easily do what he wants with a pitched roof on the garage, uh, but it it would be way out of place. I agree. Mm -hmm. I think I agree. So I, I'll move that we the, we grant the appeal and we find that the hardship is the extra, extraordinary circumstances of the architectural style uh, of the existing house. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank you. Appreciate your time. The next case to be presented to the board is 2018-310 involving the property at 10 Music Square East. Broadcast Music is the appellant and owner of the property. The request is for a variance from the sidewalk requirements in the ORI Zoning District, shown here on the zoning map just south of the Division Street Roundabout, shown here on the aerial map vis-a-vis -vis the intersection of uh, Music Circle North and Music Square East to complicate both the geometry and geography of that intersection. The site plan submitted shows a proposed layout with regard to the sidewalks, or in consideration of the sidewalks that are present and that which has been proposed here. Um, side of the iconic building that's been there, of course, my entire lifetime and perhaps even all of David Ewing's lifetime from my Wait recent site the visits. <laughs> the uh, old the country music hall theme was there. The, uh, Michael, during your time in Dixon. The uh, existing sidewalks as shown here in front of the uh, main freight frontage of the property, or uh, the uh, side frontage of the property. From my recent site visit, the upper left-hand corner is a view across the street for context on the sidewalks in existence there. Lower right hand, of course, is down the uh, side street off Music Row. Then, to get a sense of the sidewalks, once again, as they exist here, the walls that you see further down, the view down uh, Music Row, coming, that's looking back toward the roundabout. Again, to give you a sense of the proximity of the uh, uh, change in topography and the existing structure. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 310? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation of the board with regard to the sidewalk variance request for this corner lot in the Music Row area. Please introduce yourself by name and address. Thank you, John Michael. Dwayne Cuthbertson, 2814 12th Avenue South. Uh, I'm here representing the property owner at 10 Music Square East. Uh, as Mr. Michael uh, indicated, we're requesting a variance of the sidewalk requirements for both frontages on this property. Um, the sidewalk requirement was triggered in this case by an interior remodel. The applicant is attempting to remodel the third floor of this building. There's no exterior site work being proposed with this building permit. Uh, everything's inside. Um, the, the mechanism triggering the requirement is, is really based on the value of the improvements. Um, that's compared to the assessed value of the structure. In this case, our structure is assessed at $2,177,440. The cost of our improvements was valued at 
$1,260,000. Uh, that's slightly over the 50% triggering requirement. If your improvement's over 50%, then sidewalks are required, are triggered. So, do you, do you know, is BMI a nonprofit or say a, a for-profit company? I don't know the answer to that. Please identify yourself for the record and address. And My name is Jamie Long. I'm at 692 Elk Creek Road. I'm the Senior Director of Facilities for Broadcast Music Incorporated. And tell us about these artists performing organizations, or at least artist organizations like BMI. So specifically for BMI, we are a not-for-profit organization. We operate under GAP principles. Okay. okay. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, the sidewalk requirement is really triggered by a slight, uh, uh, our, the cost of our improvements is just slightly over that trigger requirement. Uh, we could attempt to value engineer the, the improvements, but the, the applicant really wants to do a quality job uh, in making improvements to the inside of the building. Um, so, so this slight overage hits us with a pretty significant additional requirement for sidewalks, uh, where there are sidewalks that exist on both frontages, and they're pretty healthy sidewalks, as the images uh, show, um, in, in lieu of constructing the sidewalks, we'd be asked to pay a pretty hefty fee in lieu. Uh, so we're asking for a variance of both of those. This is something that was not anticipated with uh, the internal um, improvements that are proposed here. Uh, Again, as the um, images show, there are really healthy sidewalks on both frontages. Those sidewalks are consistent with a pattern that exists along both Music Square East and Music Circle North. Um, Music Circle North presents some pretty um, unique challenges in that the building is constructed right up to the existing right-of-way, right up to the existing sidewalk. Uh, there's not room to expand the right-of-way and, and implement the sidewalks that are required by uh, Metro in this case. Uh, in addition to that, we've got some topography on Music Circle North, uh, the, the South Street. Um, Which that, is the view we have here? That's actually Music Square, okay. Music Square East. We're being asked to do something on Music Square. As we're, well. we're asked to be. We're asked to do sidewalks on both Music Circle North and Music Square East. With very confusing. Sorry, it's so a North confusing. and East. Yes. Okay. Uh, so in Music Square East is the main road, Music Row, um, uh, that also presents some challenges with topography. There are existing light poles, uh, signage that would have to be relocated because of this sidewalk requirement. The other thing that sidewalk requirements, if we were to build them, would trigger would be gra a grading permit. All of a sudden, we'd have to redesign the site, redesign some of the grading to adjust it. We'd have to put in retaining walls on Music Square East. Uh, that would trigger us into that grading review from Metro, which would require us to go get a civil engineer to put out plans, and we're talking another 45 days, 60 days worth of review time and expense. Um, Ken, as we kind of mentioned, this site's, this site's uniquely large. If this were a 50-foot lot, I don't think we'd be here having this discussion or, or a, a moderately sized property. But this site presents 315 feet of frontage on Music Circle North and 150 feet of frontage on Music Square East. That's 465 feet of frontage. So the fee in lieu for us on just on Music Circle North is $56,070. Um, for Music Square East, we're looking at $26,770 for the fee in lieu for a total of $82,840. And I know the board can't consider finan make financial considerations, but that's a pretty hefty sum uh, that's tacked on to an internal improvement that the applicant's proposing here. Um, we are, are certainly willing to dedicate the right-of-way on Music Square East so that when Metro comes in and redoes the entire corridor, they've already got the right-of-way for this portion of the property. Music Circle North, I'd love to say that we dedicate the right-of-way, but we've got structures in it. Um, so that one's a little more challenging for us to work out the right of way. But again, Music Square East. I have a question again for uh, on the, you said it's nonprofit, and I guess as a nonprofit, you don't pay property tax like most nonprofits that own their buildings. Is that true? So I'm, I'm not sure as to, I know we do pay property tax. I, I know that we have uh, sought a reduced amount of property tax, tax uh, recently. But we do pay property tax, and we oper operate as a not-for-profit. Okay. 
But you would say your building is worth more than $2 million? Uh, I, I, my wife would be upset if I tried to build it. I don't know what its value is. But the, <clears throat> I do know that um, in our business model, after we pay for um, our operating costs, all our monies go to the songwriters. So the impact of the in lieu fee would come directly out of royalties to uh, Music Row songwriters, or BMI songwriters. Can we go back to the picture of Music Square East? Um, keep going. Not that, that one. So I see that maybe you can't build to the MCSP standards, but you can build something and give a little green strip where the existing sidewalk is. I mean, you'd have to move, you have to work around a pole and maybe move your sign, but why can't you do the alternative sidewalk design that planning's asking for? Well, I'd, I'd, I guess I'd respond. Without, without having a detailed plan, I'd, we can't work around that pole. We'd move it. We'd have to move it. It can't be in the walkway. Um, along with any other obstructions, including existing landscaping, the historic sign over there, that may be far enough away, but wherever we move that sidewalk, there could not be any obstructions. We'd have to relocate them. Well, planning is talking about an alternative design, working with them on an alternative design. Do you have their recommendation? I do, okay. in front of me. I, there's ways to jog the sidewalk and get in some green space and there is. Um, if we have to move that sidewalk, I don't know how it'll affect the existing curb line. Will we have to deal with storm you know, relocating utilities? I don't know that, but I'm pretty certain that would trigger the 150 feet of sidewalk on this street would likely trigger a grading permit. And so then again, we're getting into site work and time and review for a permit that we're really just changing out the layout of the third floor of so, this building. Well, I agree that's unfortunate. It's just the way yeah. the ordinance is yeah. written. So what, what was it in the budget that, g give me those numbers again. Sure. That, that triggered it. Well, so it's the valuation of the permit is what it's, it's triggered on. And so, um, and, and they go off of the assessed value of just the improvements, not the improvements in land, um, not the appraised value, but so, so how much okay. are you spending on this renovation? So, the the cost of our improvement is one point one million two hundred and sixty thousand dollars. The uh, the assessed value per Metro's website is two million one hundred and seventy seven thousand four hundred and forty dollars. Any other questions for the applicant? If we, um, do you have preferences? Do you want to give us your second best hope? I, I think that the, the second best hope is that because the structure is built right up to the property line on Music Circle North, and that is almost an excessive frontage, um, we would like relief entirely of the sidewalk requirement and the fee and lieu on that frontage. On Music Square East, um, you know, I think we're more willing to work with that frontage, whether it be work with planning or as they recommended, pay the fee and lieu for that frontage. I think for me, you have very articulately, articulated a very good plan B, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions for the applicant? Close the public hearing discussion. Well, um, you know, I, 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 I we can go however, however you want to go. I just will say I, I have driven, I drive by this property every day. I, I drove around it twice just to understand uh, when I saw the, the poster. And I do think that the hardships described are real. Uh, I do think it's one of the nicer sidewalks that, uh, in, in the area. There are always a lot of people there. Um, and I, I've never had a, safety issue with the the sidewalk there so I I'm frankly empathetic with uh, with their case I do think that in this situation it does seem to be um, although I, I don't totally understand the, the property tax uh, response and I know there are different levels of nonprofit but I do think that this is a case similar to one that we heard 
of the building over by the sportsplex where the nonprofit medical office was doing interior renovations and because they just really aren't being assessed because they're a nonprofit, I don't think that their valuation is caught up with, you know, with the assessed value that we record that, that it causes an issue when you do an internal renovation. And I think, to me, that's the case here. And I think this is one of these cases, if you've been inside the BMI building, it's beautiful. And, you know, marble floors, all this other stuff, I'm sure if a real assessment would be even more than that. Yes, but I would point out we have a lot of single homeowners come before us that don't have a $1.2 million renovation, of which 80000 is a fairly small percentage of the overall budget. Mm -hmm. oh, I agree. Uh, but I would sort of, I am, because we have done this in some rural areas with some lengthy frontages, I am sympathetic to the Music Circle North uh, mm -hmm. request to waive the in lieu. I am less sympathetic on Music Square East, and I, but I'm willing to give them the option to construct or pay the in lieu. And I would make that a motion if anybody wants to consider it. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Discussion? No, and I, I, I think this goes, I mean, no discussion just goes back to the issues that we are continuing to have with the sidewalk ordinance that we hope will be fixed. Okay. Well, and and uh, Mr. Taylor, I agree with some of the comments that you made earlier, uh, because we have looked, and if this were adequately appraised, there's no doubt this renovation would not meet the 50% level, and I think it would be truly unfair, and for this reason, I cannot support Ms. Chapel's motion. And they also said that they could have easily value engineered it, or, you know, I'm not sure why. If you do a million dollar renovation, oh, we're gonna do the 100,000 next month, and that's the one conference room. It's like, but they're just doing it the regular way. So, um, but I agree with you, Ms. Sanford. Um, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Three, three. Aye. Another aye. motion? Well, uh, I'll, I'll make a motion that we that we grant the variance outright with uh, no payment to the fund, provided that they pro uh, give a right of way on Music Square East that they agreed to do. Okay, motion's been made. I'll second it. Um, any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Oh, okay, three, then, three again. Then I would, uh, is it possible now to change a vote on the other motion? It is possible. Then I'll, I'll change my vote on uh, Ms. Chapel's motion. Otherwise, uh, if I don't change my vote, then it's, you're going to have to pay on everything. So that, that actually gives you plan B. So I'll, I'll change my vote. Okay, let's have another official motion again. I make a motion that we uh, deny the request of variance as the music circle Lord but we grant the, well, but that we allow them on Music Square East to either construct uh, subject to planning approval or to pay the in lieu. Okay, motion's been made, is there a second? Second. Can I get a clarification of that motion? I thought I heard a denial of the variance on Music Was it effectively a renewal of the original motion, Ms. Yes. Chapel, which I understood it's to be same, a variance on the long side and a build or pay option on, on the, the short, short side. side? Yep. That's right. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'm going to second and just clarify that an alternative design can be constructed mm -hmm. on East. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded and amended. Um, any more discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. I gotta go, guys. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be considered by the board is 2018-262. This involves the property located at 707 Skyview Drive in Council District Number 6. Kelly Paulette is the appellant and owner of the property. It's a short-term rental case. Mr. Osborne has the case on behalf of staff and will make his presentation to the board, after which you'll hear from the appellants. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 262? 
Seeing no one in the audience, the appellants will have five minutes after the staff presentation. Mr. Osborne. So this pr property had oh, a permit. Please, oh, oh, go ahead, Mr. Osborne. This property was issued a permit on April 19th, 2017. Um, due to an ownership change on July 27th, 2017 to a uh, LLC, the permit was canceled. Um, but it wasn't canceled until March 26th of 2018. Um, so it looks like there were about 55 reviews for this property between August 2017 to March of 2018. Um, it looks like the LLC, the registered agent is um, Kelly Paulette, but the address for that is uh, 413 Sandcastle Road. And in the letter she sent out to notify the neighbors, it mentions another house in Virginia. So I'm a little uh, concerned that if she lives there or not for her type one permit. Any questions of Mr. Osborne? Thank you. Please identify yourself for the record address and um, respond to what Mr. Osborne said. Good morning, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matthew McIntyre, 6009 Kenwood Drive. My office address is 2809 12th Avenue South. Uh, I represent... I'm Kelly Paulette and I reside at 707 Skyview Drive. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give just a quick overview so we can get this moving promptly and then uh, direct some questions for Ms. Paulette. This case is a fairly unique situation. This is not the typical, um, I just forgot, didn't realize it was necessary to get a permit, et cetera, et cetera. This is a case where an owner tried to follow the law, did follow the law, and among some of the rapid changes and amendments in the short-term rental code, um, made a change that adversely affected her. She obtained the permit, uh, as Mr. Osborne noted, in April 19 of 2017, got, got her short-term rental permit. She had previously asked if the property could be in an LLC. Uh, asked codes, she was told in writing that yes, it could. Um, subsequently, put it in an LLC, and then at the time of renewal, when she tried to renew in, when she tried to renew in March of 2018, uh, was shortly thereafter said, told the renewal was rejected, she was returned her check, and then the permit that she already had was claimed to have been retroactively denied. She didn't get a 15-day notice period, but it was said to have been retroactively denied or retroactively terminated as of the date she moved it into the LLC. Um, immediately moved it back into her own name, and I'll let her talk about why she went back and forth. Um, so what we're actually asking for is uh, for, for the grant of the renewal, or failing that, she, after the renewal was denied, she reapplied, she terminated all of her rentals uh, and reapplied, and so we'd ask that that be allowed to go forward. Um, Ms. Paulette, just to clarify some of the questions Mr. Osborne had, do you own any other properties anywhere other than 707 Skyview Drive? I do. I own one property uh, in Virginia, which actually my mother lives there, so I support her financially, and so I own her home. Okay. Do you personally live in Virginia? No. Okay. No, my primary residence is here full time. Okay. Uh, Let me, can I ask her something? Sure, absolutely. Why did you do this LLC thing? I'm sure there's <laughs> advice bad, from bad some advice. lawyer. Or yes, it person. was a tax accountant. My mother obviously doesn't pay a, um, a mortgage, so I, you know, used the Airbnb, what little extra I had to try to support her. I travel a lot, so when mm -hmm. I'm gone, I use that. So he suggested doing it for tax purposes. It was yes. easier accounting. And I should have- Not knowing about the laws of Nashville. And again, at the time I applied originally, remember in 2017, I was told that you could have okay. it in an LLC. So it was a little yep. confusion on my part, and he obviously okay. did So it. the it council person good. spoke very favorably on your behalf. You have three letters of support, including one from the council person here. Um, any questions for the applicant? Okay. I think we're done. Um, let's close the public hearing. Discussion? 
like I said, at the top of the meeting, and Councilman Withers said he was feeling rather generous today. Maybe it was because of that almost seven hour meeting they had. But um, I think that this is an, an error that they obviously didn't know. They weren't trying to thwart the law. And, you know, but the law does say you're not supposed to put this in an LLC. They sought to correct this, and they're here for compliance. So I think we should uh, look at this favorably. Anybody? Do you reinstate the permit, or do you let them apply for a new John Michael, what's the, what, are, what's, what can the we do? The permit is formally canceled. It may be cleaner for the board to consider um, with the newer application, which I understand has been filed, uh, whether to reduce substantially the one-year wait that would otherwise be associated with okay. the new application now that the ownership has been changed back to the okay. individual. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion on case uh, 262 that the zoning administrator did not err in this, but the um, due to the enthusiastic support of the council and the error in having put this in the wrong thing that the applicant be eligible to apply for this short-term um, um, permit on Monday. That's motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Could, could I just clarify, uh, there actually has already been a new application made. Um, right, but you're not eligible for a year. Okay. I understand. I just didn't know if you were. We're allowing you to be eligible on Monday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we 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 would say tomorrow, but but it, it gives the staff time to to no, I just don't you know process the meeting and do this. so you're not there at eight o'clock in the morning and have to wait for somebody to figure it out. We just say we'll just wait till Monday. I just wasn't sure if the existing pending application. Well, the could pending be application would be rejected because oh. of the. Come in money and get a permit. <laughs> okay. Motion. That's the motion. Is there a second? There's a second, Mr. Sanford. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Come Thank back you. on Monday. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is case 2018-285 involving the property of 4909 Salem Drive. This is a short-term rental case. Shawana Sheehan is the appellant and owner of that property. If you'll come forward at this time, uh, Mr. Osborne has the case for staff and will make his presentation, after which the appellant will have the opportunity to address the board. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 285? Seeing none, that'll be a five-minute window for our appellants. Mr. Osborne. So we found about, out about this one through host compliance. We sent a letter on April 2nd. Looks like the operation dates back to May of 2016 through April of 2018. There are about 88 reviews on that. Um, looks like the listings were removed around April 12th, and they filed their appeal on April 25th. Um, it looks like there's two separate advertisements that one mentions access to the main floor and that there's the basement listed. So maybe some simultaneous rental going on there. Okay, get us started. Name, address, and why you're here. My name is Jonathan Sheehan. I live at 4909 Salem Drive. And I'm Shauna Sheehan, 4909 Salem Drive. Okay, what happened? You operated an Airbnb, Airbnb for many years, mm -hmm. short-term rental, without a permit. Why? Well, I want to express our apologies for you know, to the council for operating the short-term rental um, outside the bounds of the laws. Um, we just, we didn't realize that we were outside the bounds of the laws and as soon as we got a letter, we took it down from Airbnb. Okay. So uh, did you, uh, did you rent after you got the letter? No. No, we have not. Did you we cancel all future reservations? We did. How many? There were, I didn't count, approximately 10, I would say. Okay. Several. We were booked, we got it in very early April, and okay. we were booked through to early June. Yep. And so we okay. canceled all those. So, any, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, any questions for the applicant? Well, I did have a question. Um, Mr. Osborne mentioned simultaneous rentals. Do you have two rental properties in that house? We do rent our basement on a regular basis. We have a separate entrance and a, a full room in our basement. Um, we, about how, a year. How long do you rent that for? 
days or it, kind it, of room varies. for a day? It, it varies yeah, from, from a day to, we, we've done more than 30 two day months, rentals. Yeah, at a time. John Michael, give us some <laughs> short version. That's against the law. Don't do that. You can only have one running party at a time. You can't have two unless you violate the law and then go to court and lose. Are you Wait. saying that's so? You saying that your basement's what you rent out? That's right. On, on a, like we, we but live. You rent out we, the basement and another part. No, of the we basement. we we live upstairs. When we're oh, we rent out the basement on. A that's one rental to one. But what about the yeah. simultaneous? Were there so, I, maybe we're not understanding. Right. We do. We decided about a year into it that we would rent out our whole house when we were going to be out of town. And, Just and, as a supplement. In addition to renting out the basement. Not, not yeah. in addition to. They, they can rent out the whole thing. No, but could I rent out, could one person rent out the basement and one person rent out the whole house? It is a possibility that, that, that has. That we can't okay. do that. You, but it's never, has it ever happened? It's never happened but before. But you've posted, and that's what I think. Yeah. Is the, okay, okay. we definitely did not know that was. I realize that. Illegal. It is very illegal. Okay. Well, just for clarification um, from Metro, is it legal to rent out your whole house at one time and then a week later just rent out your basement? Are you allowed to do You could that? rent out seven different rooms on seven different days. However, it's got to be to seven different parties for the duration of those yeah. stays. Think okay. of it this and way. You can't have uh, the Ewing family come stay in the east wing of your palatial mansion, Ms. Karpinek, and the Michael family stay in the west wing of your palatial mansion. And, and that's why I asked time. when they go out of town and rent the quote unquote whole house, could someone else rent the basement? And the answer was yes. Yeah. Okay, so you can vary how you rent your home. Okay. Okay. Other questions okay. for the applicant? Anything else to add? Well, we're just obviously asking for a little bit of grace. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we have filed the income that we've made from it the last two years since we've been doing it on our federal income taxes. So we were absolutely not trying to hide anything. Have you paid it was the just hotel motel tax to the system? We system? have three thousand yes, dollars of it. Yes. But you've made a lot of money. That's correct. <laughs> well, we've been very blessed by it, and I do want to just say, as I mean, we just we try to give back to our community. We give back globally with the money. We we did it initially. We do it to supplement our income. My husband's an elementary school principal. I work part time. We both work part time for a nonprofit in the developing world. Mm -hmm. So this has just been a great opportunity for us um, to supplement our income. But we also have tried to do good with it. We support refugees in the city. We support missionaries around the world. So we just would ask, yes, we understand that we were operating illegally. We were not aware of that. As soon as we were made aware of it, we have tried to do everything you know, the right way, and we will promise to yeah. from now, from we, here we on. We want to operate within the bounds of the laws, now knowing what the laws are, yeah. including the one we just learned right now. <laughs> yeah. OK. Thank you. We're close to public hearing discussion. Uh, I'll move the zoning administrator did not err based on the and uh, in denying the short term rental permit based on the specifics of this case. Uh, the applicant will be eligible to apply for a permit on July 1st. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. You're eligible to apply on July 1st. We don't give out permits. Codes does. Right. So. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate it so okay. much. Thank you. John Mr. Mike. Chairman, next case is 2018-286. Connie Pollock is the appellant and owner of the property at 4153 Alva Lane in Council District Number 31. This, too, is a short-term rental case. Mr. Osborne has the case on behalf of staff. Uh, if Ms. Pollock is present, please come forward at this time. If Ms. Pollock is not present, I will suggest to the board that we defer that case to a later date. Okay, we'll defer it one meeting. That case will be taken up on the 7-5 docket. The next case to be presented to the board is case 2018-287. Joel DeSantis is the appellant and owner of the property at 1019 Davidson Road in Council District Number 23. Item A appeal involving a short-term rental property. Mr. Osborne will present the case on behalf of staff. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 287? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after the board hears from staff. 
All right, so we sent a host compliance letter on March 4th, 2018. Looks like operation was from June of 2017 to January of 2018, about 34 reviews, and then they filed their appeal on 425. Looks like the listing was removed around March 11th. Okay, get us started, name, address, and why you chose to rent without a permit. I'm Joel DeSantis. Uh, Please press the button. Oh, <laughs> I'm one of those people. My name is Joel DeSantis. I live at 1019 Davidson Road, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. So why'd you rent without a permit? Ignorance. Uh, I went on a date with a girl and she rents out one bedroom and she was like, you don't need a permit for that. I was like, oh, okay, if I'm renting out one bedroom in my house, I guess I don't need a permit. Ah, uh, the new blame it on the girlfriend excuse. No, it's laziness. I didn't look into the law. Um, I live in my house alone. I have four bedrooms and mm -hmm. the previous owners put an addition on uh, over the garage, a bedroom. So I, that's my bedroom. And then there's an old master bedroom, so I have four bedrooms. And okay, so what have me, you so. learned about city laws and other dealings with metro government with this process? Uh, it was my first experience, a learning experience, and I learned uh, I need to research things, do my due diligence, and, and follow the laws. Do you have a computer, tablet, smartphone? Yes. We could have easily gone to Nashville.gov, looked at the short-term rental yes. section. Now, are you paying the fine city of Nashville hotel motel taxes that you have been collecting, hopefully? Yes. Are you current? I have one more check I need to send in. One more check to send in. Yes. Okay. What, what day was the last day you rented your house? Um, it would have been in January sometime. After that, I had a couple living with me. They were basically like living, living with me and painting. They painted a couple of my rooms and trade for rent. So they're, yeah. So January was the last time, and then you got the letter. I got it in March. So and then you took everything down. Yeah, I really wasn't renting even at that point. I got the letter and, and freaked out, and then I turned the listing off. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. I apologize for my. Okay. Um, Your lack of knowledge. My mistake. It's all on me. I can't blame anyone else. Okay. Let's not throw the girlfriend over under the bus. <laughs> okay. Uh, close the public hearing. Discussion. It was only one date. Oh. <laughs> She's not out of the picture. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, to me, the, the main thing was that um, did everything suppose you were supposed to do let, didn't rent uh, hasn't rented since january i'll move the zoning administrator didn't air uh, applicant you know, did operate prior uh, to obtaining a permit based on the last rental of uh, or the, the listing being removed in march 11th and the last rental um, being in january that the applicant's eligible um, to apply for a permit on monday okay motion's been made is there a second I'll second. Okay, motion's been yeah, based made. on the three month penalty yes. from the last. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. John Mr. Michael. Chairman, the next case is 2018 288. Dawson Morris is the appellant and owner of the property located at 508 Russell Street. This is a short term rental case. Uh, if you'll come forward at this time, Mr. Morris, Mr. Osborne will have the case for staff. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 288? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after the board hears from staff. Mr. Osborne. So we sent a letter through host compliance on this one, 12-1-2017. Looks like there are about 20 stays from April 2016 to November 2017. Uh, PL was filed April 25th, 2018. Looks like the listing was removed. March 2nd uh, came up a time or two and was back down again by March 29th. But there were no changes whenever it popped back up. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay, nope, thank you. In your packet, board members, you have a letter of support from Councilman Withers and one letter of opposition from a neighbor on Fathom Street. So please start, name your name, address, and why you're here. My name is <clears throat> William Dawson Morris. I live at 508 Russell Street, 37206. Um, and I'm just here to appeal the, um, to apply for a permit before the uh, one year limitation. 
Yes, we know all of that. So <laughs> why did you not bother to research I, this? Same as you've heard before, I just didn't know. I, I saw on the news frequently that there was an issue with non-owner occupied, um, especially in our neighborhood, but you know, I just didn't know that we had to have one. It was just a total case of naivety. No um, ex-girlfriend at fault. No, no. Okay. So um, when did you last rent? It was in 2017. So when I got the letter at the beginning of January, I didn't remove the listing. I just removed any, uh, I blocked all available dates. So you so, didn't cancel so future listings? There were no future listings. So I had no... No future listings on Russell Street? <laughs> no, I didn't. $6 Uber ride away from Lower Broadway <laughs> and nobody went to... It was rent. only rented eight times in 2017. So it's very inf infrequent that we you make it available. You a good listing. <laughs> I don't understand. It's in a good spot for it, but we keep I keep it blocked for the most part. So it was very easy just to, to block it. So you blocked it. Why? How come you didn't just take it all down? Well, the site is not that e easy to navigate, and I had heard from a friend that you were supposed to ghost it. Um, instead of, it, I was told that, or I understood to make it unavailable, um, which I did. So that was very easy to just block the weekends that were that were there. Um, and then when I learned that you could hide the account, I did hide it. So. Okay. Right. Any questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? No, sir. Just okay. close the public hearing discussion. I mean, this is this is one where Councilman Withers said that he would prefer that the applicant be eligible immediately, and I tend to agree. So I'll, I'll I will make a motion that the applicant did. Uh, the zoning administrator didn't err. The applicant did operate prior to obtaining a legal permit uh, based on the recommendation from the councilman uh, and the fact that the applicant has not rented the property since uh, December of last year that the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit on Monday. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? I will second. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. You're eligible on Monday. Thank Go you very get much. Get a permit this time. John Mr. Mike. Chairman, the next case is 2018-289. Jennifer Hicks is the appellant and owner of the property at 8507 Poplar Creek Road. A short-term rental case. Mr. Osborne will have the case for staff. Ms. Hicks will come forward. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 289? Seeing none, the appellant will have five Five minutes after staff presentation. Mr. Osborne. We sent in a letter through host compliance on April 3rd, 2018. Uh, looks like the listing was removed April 18th or around there. There are 24 reviews from June of 2017 to March of 2018. No other complaints. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay, let's get started. Name, address, and we wanted to know where is the house? It's in those woods. Okay. Um, my name is Jennifer Hicks at 8507 Poplar Creek Road, Nashville 37221. Uh, like most other um, people here today, I just absolutely did not know you had to have a permit. Um, I, I thought you did if you like were downtown Nashville, particularly East Nashville, that seems to always have been a hot topic. But um, I'm really out in the country, and I'm I'm really close to Williamson County. And I had to have friends that had Airbnbs there, and nobody had permits when I started this last summer. And uh, I, around December, though, I did start hearing about it, and so I did go. I wasn't totally going rogue. I went um, in December to apply, and I met with David, and I gave him all my things, and I thought I'd, I was pretty good. Um, but he told me to get my um, neighbor's consent, not consent, but to do a- um, Notification. Notification, yes. Um, to, well, to get signatures from them. Well, and not I'd, signatures, you just have to send them a certified letter saying, hey, I'm applying. And there's really not a whole lot they can do after that, but you put them on notice. Right. Well, there. I mean, I knew. I know two of my neighbors really well. I didn't know the new people across the street. So did you send those letters? No, I talked to them and got signatures, except for the people across the street. I didn't know them, and they were never home. They just bought the house, and um, I just kind of dropped the ball on that. It, they said it was um, a courtesy in form, so I kind of didn't. A didn't courtesy in form required by the statute. <laughs> Right, so that was totally my fault. But um, 
I mean, I paid all my taxes and I, I, I did get um, the letter and I shut it down that day. I just didn't happen to get the letter um, as soon as they sent it. But um, okay. I am in full compliance and I'm ready to do anything I need okay. to. Questions of the applicant? Anything else to add? Okay, we're gonna close public hearing discussion. Um, well, I'll, I'll move that the zoning administrator didn't err. Uh, applicant uh, operated prior, and the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit uh, three months after the last after it was removed, which was April uh, 18th, so that would be eligible to apply on July 18th. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and proper. Yes, anything else? Is there, yeah. is there any? Um, public no, public hearing is closed. Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. You're eligible on the 18th. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2018-295. Case involves Sarah Bear, the appellant and owner of the property located at 1010 Delmas Avenue in Council District Number 5. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 295? Oh, Seeing no one, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation of the BZA after staff makes its presentation. Mr. Osborne will have that presentation. So this permit was initially issued back in November 2015, and that was renewed, but there's an ownership change in February 2017 when the uh, Sarah got her, her permit for an owner-occupied. Uh, we sent a host letter on April 3rd because it had expired. Um, and it looks like it was removed around May 8th. I am concerned that she does not live there as the advertisement states, the house will be all yours during your stay. I only rent to one group at a time and I do not live here. Hey. Any questions of Mr. Osborne? So. I do live there. But that's in your ad. Who no. posted that? Um, well, it's my ad. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like at the time I meant like I'm not, I'm not there when you're staying there. Like I don't live there when you're staying there. So I think that might have been a poor choice of words. So where do you live when someone is staying there? Um, so, so I. What? Well, I let's get started. Identify yourself for the record and address. Thank you. My name's Sarah Bear. I live at 1010 Delmas in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. How long have you lived there? Since February 15, 2017. And is that when you bought the house? Correct. Um, so this is an, an issue of me operating illegally or lack of knowledge of the law as I've been properly permitted and up to date on all my hotel taxes, but rather an oversight of the renewal time frame as it happened when I was out of state. I purchased and moved into the home on February 15, 2017. From February until December, I traveled for work between here and California. The property and bookings were managed by a friend in my absence, which was not often. In late December, we blocked all future dates, making it unavailable to rent on the rental sites as I was planning to be here full time uh, with my family on March 1st of this year. My permit was up for renewal in February, and while I'm sure I received the rental notice, I can honestly say I did not physically receive it or open it. I have never had a problem um, receiving my mail during the time living there. However, I was not—I was only in Nashville one time in January, as I was spending those first two months making all arrangements for my family to move here full time. In late April, I received, or in April, I received a notice that my permit had expired. Um, I emailed and scheduled a visit to come in and renew. That was with David on April 30th. I started the process to appeal, and I'm here now. Um, I think the reason I was flagged was because in April, my rental manager switched my profile over from me being a co-host to myself, being a sole host. Um, it wasn't with the intent to rent again, but just rather switch the management of it. Uh, at that time, I think it was turned back on um, because I think it was turned back on making it available for people to rent. I didn't make any bookings at that time because I didn't realize it was turned on. Um, I haven't had any bookings since February, and um, all dates have been, it's unlisted, but all dates have been uh, completely blocked. I would like to have the permit. I do travel for work now and again and don't plan on using it very often, um, but it would be beneficial to my income to have the opportunity to do so when we travel for work and vacations. Okay. Question for the applicant. So do you own, do you own any other property in Davidson County? No, sir. 
Okay. And so you, you just were traveling. So, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like you've lived here much. I mean, it sounds like you really moved in this spring, right? Um, I lived here for six years in 2000, and uh, I moved in 2012, and I moved back February 17th of 2017. Right, but you weren't here, uh, I mean, you, you said you weren't here much at all between February and I'm December. I'm sorry, I wasn't in, um, I was here most of the time. I didn't rent it often. I went back and forth between here and California. Okay. Where my family was. Okay, for any, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing discussion. I mean, the, yeah, I mean the, the rental history, at least from host, between February and December, shows two, between two and four per month, so I mean, that's not a couple weekends, or all week, you know, depends on. I was here it. during the week. Okay, we're closed yeah. the public hearing. So, dis discussion, motion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Motion. What do you think? That's what motions are for. I think it's certainly on the low end. I think it's certainly on the low end. Okay. okay. Well, then I'll, um, I'll move that um, the zoning administrator did not err, applicant did operate prior, and it appears it appears the last documented stay was in February. I will say that el applicants are eligible to apply for a permit on July 3rd. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. You're eligible on July 3rd. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to the board's consideration is 2018-297. Amanda Scarpelletti is the appellant and owner of the property at 1427 Shelton Avenue in Council District Number 7, out in East Nashville. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 297? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation to the board after Mr. Osborne, on behalf of staff, makes the presentation. Mr. Osborne. We found out about this through host compliance. We sent a letter on March 4th, 2018. Uh, the, that listing was removed around March 11th. There is one stay in February of 2018. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Nope. Okay. Let's get started. Name, address, why you're here. I am Amanda Sharpaletti. I live at 1427 Shelton Avenue, um, Nashville 37216. And I am here because I basically got overly excited, um, started the process of getting my short-term rental permit in January. I notified all but one of my neighbors who was a rental property and the owner lives in California. So it took me quite a while to actually connect with him and then um, get that notification to him. I changed my insurance and I also made the website on Airbnb. Now, I know in retrospect that it was now illegal to advertise. I did not think it would have been at the time. I also didn't know of this Insta book. So basically what happened was I thought I blocked out all the dates. I didn't. And a person Insta booked, which meant they could, they could confirm without me saying like, yes, I'm to it. So they did and I basically weighed my options between being penalized by canceling the booking or going ahead. So I went ahead and I had one person stay at the Airbnb um, while I was still trying to get the permit process um, started on my end. And then um, I removed the Instabook immediately and I had it all blocked anyhow. Um, I was just advertising beforehand and then I got the notice and canceled it. It like, like took it you know, off the website so at that point. So this is your personal home? Yes, it's my home. Okay. Any questions of the applicant? We have three letters of support in the file, including a neighbor that lives down the street that has the same <laughs> last name, I imagine a family member. Yes. <laughs> so, 
It's always nice right. to have your family support. Right? I mean. Yes. So, um, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. We're going to close public hearing discussion. I mean, I, I'll move that the zoning administrator didn't err. She the, she did operate prior to obtaining a permit uh, based on the fact that it was uh, rented only one time in the last uh, in February, and the last listing was uh, the listing was taken down in um, March uh, on March 11th. That the applicant's eligible to apply for a permit on Monday. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Oh wait a minute, there was no second. <laughs> I will oh, second. It's late. I'll second. Motion has been made and now seconded. Okay. Yes. Lawyers are they're supposed to keep us straight. Uh, we hadn't voted yet. Yes, I know. Um, yes, we haven't voted. We might say, you know, a year. Um, any, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Passes. You're eligible on Monday. Thank you. John Michael. The next case is 2018-298. Joseph Morse is the appellant. Joseph and Jane Morse, owners of the property located at 2110 18th Avenue South in Council District Number 18. Uh, Mr. Osborne will present the case on behalf of staff. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 298? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes after we hear from Mr. Osborne. So this property was issued a permit back in March 3rd, 2017. However, that was not renewed this year. Um, we sent a letter on April 3rd, 2018, um, and it looks like the appeal was filed March or May 1st, 2018. No other complaints. Did you know when it was taken down? Um, it started operation in February 2017 and went through April 2018. Looks like it was removed. Um, between the April 30th and May 5th. Okay. Please identify yourself, um, name, address. Why My name here? is Joseph Morris. The address is 2110 18th Avenue South, Nashville, Tennessee, 37212. So um, you did everything you could to get a permit the first time. We gave you a permit, and then you didn't renew. Correct. Um, <laughs> I did, and so um, when I received the letter on, I guess it was April 2nd or 3rd, when, and uh, that it had, you know, we were in, not in compliance, and um, to be honest with you, from, from what it said, I, I thought there was a bit of a mistake. I was like, well, I got a permit, you know, and uh, so we went down, I went down to uh, the codes, and was told that, that it was expired and I was past uh, my 30-day grace okay, period. Get all that. So why didn't you send us a check for $50 and address it to the codes department? I missed the 30-day grace period. I missed the time. But why? Day. Why? I, you have this great short-term rental permit? I, I know. Well, I, this is my first time at it. I just didn't, I mean, I didn't get a notice or anything like that. Yeah, we don't I, send out notice. No, I, yeah, I know, and I'm aware of that now, and that's that's um, that's my fault. I mean, I just didn't set a reminder saying, you know, let myself know it was expired. So as soon as I got the letter, I went down to the office the very yep. next day got and it. tried to uh, reapply okay. and got an affidavit signed and did yep. all the necessary did you legwork. Did all your listings? What's that? Did you cancel your listings that you had? Not right away. I didn't, to be honest. Um, and the reason I didn't was because uh, the lady at Code said, you probably won't have to reapply. You'll just have to renew, even though I missed a grace period. And she said she gave me a form, an affidavit. I went down the hall, got it signed, brought it back. Um, and she said, leave the form here, and then, you know, we'll call you as soon as we find out if you need to renew or reapply. And I came back down to the office uh, two or three additional times and met, uh, maybe it was you, David, I'm not sure, but it was. Oh, it was not me. <laughs> no, not David, uh, this is no, David. It was okay. not him there was, a, there was another guy that was in the office that, that um, the woman said that it was on his desk in a pile and that um, when I finally spoke to him, he said, you're gonna have to reapply, which I did, I went and got all, I got letters signed by my neighbors. I've got copies of all that stuff and, and had my uh, affidavit and um, went back down and uh, met with another gentleman that pulled up my account and said, okay. he said, you still have it listed. Yep. We're gonna red flag you. And you know, so that's when I took it off the, off the site and um, 
started the appeal process. Okay. So up until that point, and I've also contacted the council, our council uh, woman, and I mean, we've been in compliance, we've paid uh, yep. all, all our right. taxes and did everything we needed to do. Okay. Um, That's it, okay, very good. Um, we're gonna close the public hearing. Let's uh, have a discussion. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the people that have the permits, uh, and especially since we don't send renewals, to me, it's 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 like for you getting to pay your car, do your car tag, and you well, pay. You well, and I want to comment that I've had a, a permit to have a security system for 17 years, and every year for 17 years, I've received a notice and a bill to pay that, and of course, I pay it. But I don't really know why we're not sending out a reminder notice. Yeah, if I may, Mr. Chairman, dollar. we do. We spend a gajillion man hours a month fooling with that. It's not required by law. That goes to Ms. Sanford's question, I think, very capably as to why it's not, but it's not. We do that as a courtesy. However, since it's not even required that we send them, it's most certainly not required that we handle every room and make sure people get them. So we hear a lot of times, but I never got a renewal notice. Well, it's not required by law. We place a lot of faith in our permittees to be able to capably mark a calendar for that 12-month period. Oh, this it's not a guessing game. Well, and I would add, I'm not getting any money out of having that permit renewed. So. Well, and and, and I want, I, okay. I'm, yeah, and, and, that being and said, no, no, and nothing against uh, codes or the process, but I, it, it, it really is to me one of those things that. Uh, that when something like this happens, you fix it and you and you move on. And so, I, okay. So motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll move that the, the uh, zoning administrator didn't err uh, because of the expired permit. The applicant did operate uh, without obtaining a permit, um, and the applicant would be eligible to. Uh, it's just an up or down. So I think you just have to say he's eligible to reapply. Right, John Michael? He's already eligible to reapply because we're working with an expired permit scenario, but he but can, can reapply. It's can a we put a time limit on that? You, well, no, with a new permit application. He's got to start all he's over. He's got to start all over, yeah. and so okay, you get the so chance so to reduce it one year. Okay. okay, so he's eligible to reapply on Monday. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Come back Monday. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2018-299. Curtis Ortmeyers, the appellant, known of the property at 2099 Tenon Road in Council District Number 10. The request is for an item A appeal involving short-term rental property for the property shown here on the aerial view. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 299? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to address the board after the staff presentation from Mr. Osborne. We sent a letter uh, through host compliance on April 2nd, 2018. It looks like they operated from February 2018 to April 2018 with 10 reviews. Um, looks like the advertisement was removed the same day they appealed on May 1st. Okay. Any questions of Mr. Osborne? No. Thank you. Name, address, why we're here. My name is Curtis Hortmeyer, uh, 2099 Tenon Road, Goodlitzville. My name is Holly Ortmeyer, and um, we both live at 2099 Tenon Road in Goodlettsville. Um, we'd like to thank you for hearing our case today um, and apologize for operating our short-term rental without a permit. Unfortunately, we were not aware that we needed to obtain one. The only other experience we've had with a rental like this is our vacation condo in Florida. Uh, we've never needed a permit to rent that out, um, so we were really unaware of this process. So we apologize for that. Um, just a little background for you. Uh, we started our Airbnb in February 2018. This was a month after Curtis uh, lost his job. He was laid off from his job. So we were looking for an alternate way to bring in some income in addition to my job. Um, this was shortly after our youngest child moved out of the house, making us empty nesters. Um, at that time, we contemplated our options, which included downsizing altogether or renting out the lower apartment of our home. Um, our home is located on five and a half country acres with three levels of living space. And so we, since we were not using the 1,300 square foot apartment downstairs, we thought we'd give an STR a shot. Um, our renters included business people, a traveling nurse, and adults looking for a peaceful retreat to come home to. 
Um, in fact, we do market it, market it as a quiet countryside retreat and did not rent to anyone under 25 years old. We do not allow parties or events. We had no issues with our guests and they were all very respectful of our distant neighbors and our property. Uh, we received a letter from Codes mid-April stating that we were non-compliant. The next day, my husband left a voicemail for Robert Osborne. We didn't get a response, so a few, few days later, he called Codes again, but was told by Mr. McBroom that Robert was on vacation. Um, Mac then provided us with the information we needed. Our last renter was the end of April, and we canceled any existing reservations on April 30th. Uh, then we appealed the decision May 1st. Since then, um, we've had two neighbors ask about the zoning sign in our yard, tell us they had no, no idea that we were even running an STR and had no problem whatsoever with us doing so and supported us. Um, I notified our council person, Mr. Doug Pardue, on Monday who said he couldn't be here today but wished us luck with obtaining the permit. Okay, uh, questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing discussion. Mr. Motion. Well, I'll move that the zoning administrator did not err. Uh, they did operate prior uh, to receiving a permit um, based on the last rental of the end of April that they would be eligible to reapply uh, for a permit on July 15th. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good, Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, case number 2018-300 has been deferred to the July 5th docket. Okay. As somebody had to catch an airplane. Therefore, we're brought to case 2018-301 involving the property at 2001 Eastland Avenue in Council District Number 6. You've already heard from the council member his expression of neutrality on the matter. Beverly Griffith is the appellant and owner of the property. This is a short-term rental case. If Ms. Griffith would come forward, Mr. Osborne will have the uh, presentation on behalf of staff. And after his presentation, if there is no one abs uh, present to oppose case 301, uh, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Okay, Mr. Osborne, get started. We sent a letter to this one on December 1st, 2017. We're not having a permit. Looks like they operated from April 2017 to January 1st, 2018. About 28 reviews. Um, the, lo the listing was initially removed on December 16th around then, and then it went up and down a couple times until it's finally down for good on April 7th. Well, tell us more about this up and down. Um, it could be that it was reposted. It could be that there was uh, some inquiry to it. it. It's hard to say from my end why it went up and down. Okay, let's hear from the applicant. Name, address, and tell us about what the posting was all about. Okay. Um, my name is Beverly Griffith. I live at 2001 Eastland Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206. And I, it's my primary residence. It's my only home. It's the only house I own. I bought it. I lived in Nashville previously. I went to college here in 99 to 2003, moved away and came back in 2014 and bought my house in 2017 in February. And it was, it's pretty much like my dream house, but the absolute maximum that I could afford. So around April, I started airbnb and I am, can't lie, like I did know that I was supposed to get a permit and I was planning on getting a permit. Um, but it just, I, 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 don't, I don't have an excuse that why I didn't. Um, I knew that I should, I just needed money uh, to pay my mortgage as soon as possible and so I did. <laughs> Um, I have since, uh, I took down the listing, and I don't know with the up and down if it's because I snoozed it, and I would snooze it for like, so it, where it disappears and no one can book. Um, I don't know, like I would snooze it to like April or like March or whatever, like thinking I would go in and get my permit before then, and then maybe it would come back up, but I've not booked anything since I... Uh, took it down and the only thing that I did do in December I got the notice um, <clears throat> and 
took like uh, booked, you know, snoozed it, took everything off the website. But I did have a one um, rental still scheduled for the weekend of New Year's Eve, and the people had two dogs, and I just really I could not like tell them. I don't know. I just felt like I couldn't. So is, is that the last day you rented the property? Yes, and I have not had it up since I've paid I have a receipt um, from the collections office I've paid all my taxes I have the forms for every month um, I don't know I mean that's it I guess I've had no I have one small bathroom um, I do not have I've never hosted anyone any number of people over five there's been there's like no tolerance for noise as stated in the listing no bachelorette parties. Um, there, I mean, only five people can stay. It's usually like two couples or like a group of friends. But yeah, there's only two bedrooms and one small bathroom, and it's not been. There's never been any complaints as far as I know. And people leave the property in like, amazing condition. Okay. Questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? I don't think so. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing discussion. Uh, I mean, based on the testimony, the applicant did operate prior, thus the zoning administrator's not in error, and we'll move that the applicant, because the last rental um, was the 1st of January, that the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit on Monday. Awesome. Okay, motion's been made, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank John Michael. So Mr. Chairman, the final case that will be heard today is 2018-312 involving the property at 4505 Georgia Avenue in Council District Number 20. Subject property shown here. Uh, Ronald Milam is the appellant. Ronald Milam and Caitlin Bird, the owners of the property. Mr. Osborne will make the presentation on behalf of staff with no opposition present. The appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation after the board hears from Mr. Osborne. We sent a notice on this one on December 29, 2017. Um, looks like it operated uh, three times between August 2017 to September 2017. And it looks like the advertisement went up and down a few times, but finally came down April 18th. And then they filed their appeal on May 7th. Okay, more up and down. But no, we don't have any evidence of it being rented after December. No, sir. Okay. Uh, name, address, and talk to us about Hi, your posting. Um, I'm Caitlin Milam. I live at 4505 Georgia Avenue. Um, I provided a timeline to kind of make it easier. Um, last fall, we decided to um, rent Airbnb for the Eclipse. Um, so we rented the place three times um, just in our guest room upstairs. And after that, we decided not to rent it until this April, we decided to go ahead and um, potentially rent it again. So we started the um, permitting process and I actually created the Airbnb site and didn't realize the advertising was also part of the deal that you had to have a permit to do that. And so as soon as we found that out, um, we started the process of taking everything down and I'm actually not very tech savvy. And so uh, the up and down was probably just for me trying to remove the information. Uh, Did with you, a snooze so mechanism. When, okay. Oh, good. When was the last time you rented the property? Uh, the last time I rented the property was uh, 9-25-2017. Um, there were some bookings, like, uh, from where I started the, adverti the advertisement. I didn't realize it the instant book. Um, and so I did have a couple people book for summer, but I called Airbnb, and all of them had been removed. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Any questions for the applicant? We're going to close, close public hearing discussion. That um, rented since September. Um, I'll move the zoning administrator didn't err and that the applicant is eligible to apply for a permit on Monday. Okay, motion has been made. Is there a second to the I'll motion? Say, I'll say. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. I think we're about done, so let's once again cheer on the West Nashville Heat and the World Series and Jack the Catcher and his all-star teammates. I hope they bring home the state championship. We are done. Thank you.
This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.